Good afternoon. Today is Thursday, September the 8th, and I'd like to call the Civilian Police Oversight Board meeting to order, and the time is 5.03. With that, uh, Ms. Barella, can we have a roll call? Member Crawford? Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Here. Member Nixon? Member Nixon? Yes. Thank you. Member Rayner? Here. Member Wartell? Here. Thank you, Chair French. You have a quorum. Thank you. And with that, <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion that we amend the agenda. We do have our appellant here, appellant here, and um, he is listed as I would like to move him up to item number. Eight. And I'll make a motion that we uh, amend the agenda to um, add the appeal as item number eight. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to um, amend the agenda and move the appellate to item number eight. Um, Ms. Sorella, will you, is there any more discussion? Ms. Sorella, will you call the roll, please? Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Dixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you, and that motion passed unanimously. Okay, then um, I'll make a motion that we accept the agenda as, it, as amended. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Barella, will you call the roll? Uh, yes, and uh, for the record, Member Crawford joined the meeting. Thank you. Uh, Member Crawford, did you catch that motion? Motion to approve the agenda as amended? Got that, to approve the agenda. Uh, that's a yes if you're starting the roll. Okay, um, it's as amended. Uh, I think you went off video. Oh, sorry, I'm muting myself now. What's what's that amendment? Uh, to move agenda, the appellant agenda number nine to number eight on the agenda. Okay, no problem, thanks for that. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and take the roll. Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimously. All right. And with that, is there a motion for approval of the consent agenda? So moved. I'll second that and then I'll open it up for discussion. Um, Ms. Ewing, I have a question on, um, and, and maybe you can answer, maybe you can't, but um, on Item D, exonerated case 170-22. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, you said. 170-22, it's yes. under the exonerated cases. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so on that case, I know that in April, uh, the ordinance changed and said that the agency would only investigate officer misconduct. This, this complaint was received, I believe, in June and it's on a, a civilian. It has nothing to do with an officer. I think it's with the um, 911 or communication to for two cops call that the um, complaint is saying that the civilian staff was, um, was rude and hateful. So I'm just wondering why that was um, done by the agency since it, it is, has nothing to do with sworn officers whatsoever or misconduct. Um, I it is my understanding that uh, that came because the CASA currently trumps the ordinance and the CASA still requires us to make that investigation. So the CASA paragraph will have to be changed for us not to uh, investigate the civilian complaints. Well, I am glad you said that because that's a point the board has been trying to make since April that the CASA trumps the ordinance because as I said, we wanted to continue getting all the cases 
with the OBDRs as we had in the past with the investigations, with the, the complaints, with the video, with everything as we had done in the past. But we were informed because the ordinance changed, that's why it didn't change. But I'm glad that now you agree that the CASA trumps the ordinance. And, and so I'm glad to make that, that to be clear, not just for the agency's um, cases, but also for the board's review uh, currently and in the future and in the past. So thank you very much for that. And that clears up a lot for us board members as to what's happened in the past. Okay, so <clears throat> um, were there any uh, cases that the um, any of the board members wanted to have pulled from the consent agenda? Okay, if so, not, I'm sorry, Member Nixon. When you say when you say pulled from the consent agenda, um, I'll, I'll just say generally, if if the case has no footage, OBRD was not provided when it was available, then I want all of those pulled. Um, Member Nixon, do you have a list of those, which ones they are? Uh, let's see, I don't know if I have all of them. Um, yeah, um, starting with zero, uh, 06022. Okay. 16422. Okay. 03122. All right. 05722. Okay. 06422. Okay. Um, 0 through 822. Okay. 04222. 042. Okay. Two two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Zero four nine two two. Okay. Zero five zero two two. Mm hmm. Zero six seven two two. And zero nine three two two. And 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 just real briefly, so I can predicate the reason I'm I'm making this um, recommendation motion, whatever you want to call it, is because I. After doing this for two and a half years, I don't see where, as a board, we can weigh in on any of these cases without having the necessary evidence on the case. Um, and OBRD footage is very important. For example, when you look at findings letters, and findings letters are talking about what the investigators saw on the lapel and what they investigated on the lapel and what they, the people, the officers said on the lapel, yet you don't have that information in front of you. How can you give an accurate depiction of, or make an ascer ascertain, uh, ascertain what has actually happened and making that determination in, in your review? So that's, that's, that's my uh, reason for this. Okay. And I'm sure this is being recorded, but Member Rella, if you need that list, I do have that list. So um, then I will change my motion. Was there, yeah, there was a motion on the floor. So I will um, um, remove my motion. And um, I hope I'm doing that right. What's the correct procedure, Tina, that I should do to, um, we didn't take a vote, so I guess we could take a vote. And if it, it got a second, if there's not enough votes, we could just come back and do another motion. Yes, Ms. Ewing. Uh, as a point of order, it's my understanding from Ms. McDermott that the videos were provided for each of those cases. Um, for the September link. There's a new link for the materials for this meeting. It's not the same link that went out in August, but it's my understanding that the videos were provided for those cases. Is Miss McDermott, I don't see her video on. Is she, I don't see her. So it could be a, oh. Yes, Chair French. Oh, okay. So say that again, Diane, I'm sorry. You said they were provided. Correct. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of frog in my throat. Um, all of those cases, I believe that I try to keep track of them all, are ones that were from the August agenda and were tabled and then put through for this agenda. And all of those were resubmitted to the board with video links. So I'm, I'm not sure if Member Nixon maybe 
was looking at the old August link, but a new link was sent, submitted uh, with videos, if there were videos for these cases. <clears throat> so I was looking at the links um, that were sent. Um, and when I look at under investigations, I see links going from August 3rd all the way up to September, uh, yeah, September 2nd. Yeah, um, Member Nixon, you were sent a link that says cases from August. And each one of those ones, which I think are all the ones that you've highlighted, um, if there were videos available, the videos were uploaded into those, into that link. Okay, so yeah, this is what I was looking at when I, when I saw those. So when I click on the, um, when I actually clicked on the uh, link that was sent for those cases. So, so now this is kind of confusing because let's see, it looks like we have two links for the same cases. I'm gonna look for one. Chair French, well, well um, Member yeah. Dixon is looking at that. In answer to your question, whoever made the original motion can seek to amend, or the person that seconded it can do a friendly amendment, depending on the board's wishes for what's pending on the floor. Well, I made the motion, so I will amend my motion. So we have two, we have two links of the same thing. I see OBRD footage on one of these. I can probably go down the, this list and see if it's actually there. More than likely it is there, but we have two different links for the same, for the same cases. Okay, Member Nixon, I'm gonna make a motion that we do pull those because you didn't have uh, the information or the time to review those OBDRs. Yeah, I'm not reviewing them no, yet. Yeah, I agree. So, I am so I'm not voting on them. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull those from, from the consent agenda. So I will make, I will amend my motion for approval of the agenda, the consent agenda um, with removing those uh, particular cases and we will add them to next, next month's agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Ms. Spirella, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Thank you. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimously. Okay. <clears throat> and just something else I wanted to say on those cases, but I don't want to go on and on about it. But um, it was um, on some of those cases, it says um, people were interviewed, but it doesn't say by Zoom, by telephone. It doesn't say how they were interviewed. Some say they were interviewed by Zoom, some don't. So in order to be consistent and transparent um, in the future, I'd like to know um, how they were interviewed. Are we being consistent with the officers? Are we doing them by Zoom? Are we do not doing them by Zoom? Um, and I did know a lot of these cases came through in April and a lot of the um, interviews were like a month apart. They would interview the, the person who, uh, complain the complainant in say May and then they wouldn't interview the officer till June and a lot of them were like that so um, just so in the future we're consistent and and with the way we uh, interview and what we do uh, please put in the investigation whether it was done by telephone or by zoom that would be helpful some of them say and like I said and some of them don't um member French yes or chair French excuse me in the past, we had the actual recording that the investigator had when they were interviewing on the phone or whatever was, was happening. And those materials are not in here either. And they were here before. Maybe, I don't know why they would not be available. Um, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a good reason for that, but I've noticed that they, they, we've stopped uh, receiving those particular uh, recordings. Okay, I'm not sure either. And we'll wait for Miss Ewing and she can get back to the to the board on that, because I'm not sure either. Um, Ms. Ewing, the other thing I noticed, I mean, <laughs> Executive Director Ewing, uh, something else that I, I did notice on that is, and I'm, I'm sure it's been happening for quite some time is, 
the officers' names are redacted from the investigation, from everything, but they're not removed from the initial complaint. So I think it's a waste of time to have staff redact the officer's name if we know what it is in the first place, because, or I think it would be beneficial if you're, if we're not to know and they need to be redacted, that it's redacted off of all information. Um, I know they might send us the original email, but I wouldn't even mind if they printed out the email, redacted the officer's name, and then submitted it along with the investigation to the board. That would be fine with me also. But just, I don't know why we, uh, it's redacted off of everything except for the original complaint. I appreciate you bringing that to my attention and I will look at the interview question um, in terms of what has been provided before and what has not. Well, regardless of what was provided before, if there's a rule that says that we're not to know the officer's name, because on the complaint form it asks who's the officer, what's their man number. If we're not to know the officer's name or that's in the policy procedure, we're not supposed, that's fine. I just, it, going forward uh, with it, future investigations, just have that removed from the complaint form. Oh, absolutely. And that, oh. I'm sorry, I was going back to the original request in terms okay. of recordings of interviews before. That is something oh. I oh. Later on. Okay, sorry. My apologies. I, I have no problems working with Diane on the additional redaction. Thank okay. you for that tonight. Okay. A related, Chair French, a, a yep. related question is, it strikes me there must be a body of research on the effectiveness of interviews via telephone versus via Zoom via, versus in person. And I'm wondering why telephone interviews are conducted when it, it to me, it's obvious that it's not as effective if you're not actually looking at the person who's being interviewed. I, I agree. And I think that all of these interviews were done this year after the ban. But the other issue I have is the inconsistency with the officers. Um, some are done in person, some are done by Zoom, some are done with the telephone call. I just think we need to uh, be consistent so no one can say anything about um, the way that uh, the agency conducts interviews with officers. And also, I agree that um, Zoom is not as effective as seeing them in person and seeing, you know, looking directly at the person, but Zoom is certainly more effective than doing it by phone, I think. So, um, Ms. Ewing will research that and in the future we'll We'll look into that. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any more um, remarks or any other from any other board member? Okay, if not, uh, we'll move on to item five. And the case is pulled from the consent agenda. Um, like I said, I only had the one 170, but um, we don't have any cases that we need to review this month because we haven't had the chance. Member Nixon hasn't had the chance to review the OBDR, OBDR so we won't be discussing any of those uh, cases that were pulled from the uh, consent agenda. And with that, I'll move on to item number six. Um, is there a motion for approval for, of the minutes from August the 11th? I did read them and they appear to be accurate and in order. So, so is there a approved? Thank so you, Member Nixon. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Farella, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Member Jackson? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Uh, Member Rayner is uh, yes. that's a, Sorry. Okay, gotcha. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. And that motion passed unanimously. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to item number seven, a pub public comment. Ms. Perillo, I believe you contacted us that there were no public comments received by the agency. Uh, Chair French? 
there were no written public comments. Uh, there were four members of the community that reached out that I submitted Zoom links for, and I'm not sure if they are in the waiting room. Uh, Ms. Ewing may know. Uh, one person is in the waiting room. I have just admitted uh, by the name of Robert, and I believe that is the Bob who was uh, mentioned in the email sent out by Ms. Barella earlier. I'm sorry. Um, all right, then. Um, did, what did he want to have? I'm sorry, uh, Miss Barella, uh, which email are we discussing? The appellant? No, that wasn't his name. Oh, no, this is public comment, Chair French. Okay, all right. And he, um, he appears to be connecting. Okay. You will let me know when he's connected? Yes, ma'am. There he is. I do believe that Robert has connected via, has connected now. Okay. I am looking for him. Does he have video? I don't see that he has video on. Um, Robert, if you can hear us and you have the ability to turn on video, we are at public comment. Okay, I see his video just came on. And sir, you'll have to unmute in order to give the public comment that you wanted to give. Oh. Unmuted. Unmuted, sorry about that. And is this Bob Haggerty? Yes, it is. All right, and I believe that we also had a Lucy Haggerty who was also going yes. to comment. I'm here too. Okay. Uh would each one of you introduce yourself and just let me say that um, each public comment, you're allowed three minutes each. Um, Ms. Barella, will you um, keep the time? Your friend. Okay. Mr. Haggerty, please feel free to go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for allowing us to come in on this. My first question is, did the mayor have some kind of program or did he tell the APD to stand down? To crime. To crime on, on some of this stuff. We, we have a lot of crime in our neighborhood and it is fairly recent. We didn't have it a couple of years ago. And uh, that's, that's the first question. And is there any way to counter the ACLU, we hear on the radio and we, we read and the city council has said that the ACLU has a lot of uh, uh, some kind of basically court orders to uh, keep from law enforcement being enforced uh, regarding you know the problems of crime, uh, the homeless, the encampments, et cetera. And uh, that's it. That, that's that's basically it for Mr. my Hag part. Okay, Mr. Haggerty, I just want to clarify something. The board does not answer questions during public comment. You are oh. allowed to make comment, but the board does not answer questions during public comment. Oh, okay. Sorry okay. about that. No, that's okay. I we welcome your comments. Ms. Uh, Ohio. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, okay, then I'll, I'll further comment. Um, my wife and I live on the west side. We have kids and grandkids. We have uh, three grandkids in a uh, private school. And there's a uh, uh, lot very close by that's been um, slated for a homeless encampment. And that's, that's very dis disconcerting for us. And in another part of our little neighborhood, there's a small park and several times a week, we have problems that 
with homeless and uh, tents going up and stuff. And uh, uh, we're just trying to uh, stop that from happening. And we do call 242 cops. And uh, that's my comment right now. And I, I guess I'll let my wife take over. My three minutes is probably up. Is this Hagerty? Yes. Um, we just want the police and let's see, you, you are part of the um, Citizen Police Oversight Committee. And, and you're committed to know that we're very concerned about what's going on in Albuquerque with encampments and crime and drugs. And uh, we hope that the police are not being told to stand down, which we heard that that was the case. Um, so we just want all of you to know that uh, we have a lot of family and friends here and we all feel the same. We're just worried about our city and it's degrading because of these encampments and being a, um, what is that designation for the city um, where they can, anybody can come here? A, a sanctuary city. We wonder if there's a way to get rid of that designation. We, we need to be not a sanctuary city. We need to be protecting our borders and things like that because our city is totally degrading. And we are hoping that this will not fall on deaf ears. We actually meant to call the, the city council meeting. We thought it was tonight, but we missed it. So we said, we'll call this meeting and get our two cents in. So uh, it's just about our concern for our city and all the things that are going on in a negative sense. Uh, we know there's good, but the bad is very, very bad. We need these drug drugs out of our city and state. Uh, so we hope and we believe you're working on that but um i don't know if you can comment back to us or not but we would like that thank you yes we're not we do not um comment back we welcome public comments but yes the board does not uh, make comments back we are um, the civilian police oversight agency um and yes you're correct on that but no we will we will not make comments we will not respond but we do appreciate uh, you coming to our board meeting and, and offering your comments. May I ask why you do not make comments? <clears throat> I, I really, there's nothing that was asked, but I will rely on our, uh, our council for that. It's, you know, it's in our board policy and procedures. Um, you mean the city council? No, it's in it's in the boards in our policy and procedures. Okay, but when you say you will rely on the council, did you mean this the city council? No, I, I, I was I was going to have our council for the board respond to you on that as to why, but um, I'm just telling you that it's in our policy and procedures that we don't uh, answer questions from public comment. We're welcome. We welcome you, and we will listen, but. Um, I just want to thank you um, for your time, for coming and making comments, but it's in our policy that we won't, we won't respond. Okay. Will our comments be part of the record? Yes. <clears throat> your comments, you will be in the minutes as making comments. Yes. Okay. Will the comments be in the record or just as making comments? Um, as making, our, our minutes are not verbatim. Okay. Just that we commented. Yes. I Chair Fritz, it. this is captured on video, correct? This is being recorded as they're commenting? Yes. Okay, so it does, it, it is being recorded. It will be on record. Okay, great. That's good. And then is it going to be like the city council meetings where we could go back and watch the whole meeting? I know it's, I'm watching it right now, but. Yes. It is going to, it is going to be put out to the public. Okay. It comes up on Gov TV and YouTube. Yes. Okay. Got it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. We support the police. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> we'll move on to item number eight. And I believe that our appellant is here, correct? He is. 
and is he, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I will just say Sanjay because sir, I don't think I can pronounce your last name. <laughs> Could you unmute yourself, please? <clears throat> you're, you're muted. No. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, all I said was, uh, you know, feel free to call me Sanji, so. Sanji, okay. Yes, yes ma'am. So let me just explain to you that uh, we did receive your request for re reconsideration. Okay. And, as, <clears throat> and the, um, I just wanted to ask you, did you submit any new evidence? Because if you did, we did not, the board did not receive any. Uh, no, only okay. thing is, you know, the, um, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I would present it in a PowerPoint. Um, okay. It just uh, the 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 person who rear-ended me, his insurance company company paid for the damages to my car. Okay, sir. So let me just explain this process. Okay. So okay. you will have fifteen minutes to present. Okay. Okay. And then and there will be five minutes allowed for the police officer if there's pre if they're present. 10 minutes for APD if they'd like to respond. And then we'll have 10 minutes from our executive director or her designee to respond. And after that, you will have five minutes okay. at the end to, to add anything you would like. The board may ask questions at any time uh, of you or any of witnesses. And when we ask you a question, the time will stop until the question has been answered and then your time will start again. Okay, All so right. the board's questions will not impose on your 15 minutes. We do have a timekeeper here. And okay. so she will start uh, keeping your time. Uh, just okay. one question I have for you. You said that you had a PowerPoint. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure you did not present that to the agency so that they could present it to us, correct? Uh, I, you know, I mean, since, you know, um, uh, the, you know, I have only 15 minutes, so, uh, you know, so in order to get through, you know, I had to put everything into a PowerPoint. Um, so I have, I mean, you know, uh, the material in this is, you know, already material I shared with the um, um, board. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, do, would you like for us to, would you like to, uh, somebody from the board, the agency to screen share with you so that you can do your PowerPoint on screen share? Uh, we can yes, ma'am. Actually, um, you know, I, I have the option to screen share. I think I should, if I click on that, I should be able to share it with you. You want me to give it a try? Uh, yes. So the agency will have to allow you access to screen share. And then okay. once that starts, we'll start your 15 minutes. Okay. Um, uh, Director Ewing, is that possible to screen share? I am okay. trying right now to see. I think that if he can, he just tries it. It's currently set for one person at a time to screen <clears throat> share. Okay. Uh, I think if he tries to share his screen right now, he should hopefully be able to. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Sanjay, we will uh, start your time. Ms. Farella, are you ready? Uh, will you let him know when his time starts? Sanjay, your time has started. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to come before the board and appeal. Um, my primary complaint request was the correction of the police report and you know the police report describes a phys physically impossible scenario about changing lanes on a roadway with only one lane in each direction also the report claims you know my car was rear-ended and the report claims I was the one uh, at fault for the accident And uh, so, you know, all this happened, you know, I entered San, northbound San Pedro from the Smith's grocery store parking lot at Lomas. And as I was proceeding, you know, at um, Constitution, there was a red light, so I stopped. Um, 
And there was a gentleman uh, sitting off his bike, uh, wearing casual clothing, and he was blocking uh, traffic on um, Constitution and motioning the traffic on uh, San Pedro to uh, disregard the light and move forward. I mean, you know, this is not a police officer, no, um, no uniform, the vehicle is not marked, the motorcycle, so I didn't. And then, you know, some motorcyclists came from both sides and were shouting at me and gladly, you know, the light changed green. So I proceeded and I was confused, you know, this is, I mean, you know, civilian to block and direct traffic is illegal. So I wanted to get out of the, um, out of San Pedro as soon as possible. Um, and then, you know, I try, I slowed down in order to turn to Aspen. And that's where I was rear-ended by Mr. Pacheco. Um, and, and, you know, and he was also riding his motorcycle on the bicycle lane. And he, there was actually always a car behind me and he passed that car and came and rear-ended me. And, um, and, you know, so all this, you know, the police report was presented to, to my insurance Geico and they said, you know, the, the, this is impossible. So they referred the accident, accident to a arbitrator and he made a determination that Mr. Pacheco who rear-ended me was 100% responsible and his insurance company, Harley Davidson paid for the damages to my vehicle. And, and here um, in this video, Mr. Pacheco admits to rear-ending my car. Uh, I just want to make sure, can you all hear the uh, audio? We no, cannot. Can. You cannot? No. Okay. no sir. Uh, let me try something real quick. Uh, can you hear the video now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, thank you. Who's involved? the guy in the car right there. Okay, do you need rescue? Uh, she's sending somebody to check on me just in case. Okay. So we were in a funeral procession. He, he cut us all off over here. Off right here by this gas station. He cut all in front of all of us at the light. So right here, we were flying 35. He slams his brakes to turn right as we're all going there at the last minute. So as I tried to avoid him, right in the back of his car. And, and this is, you know, like four seconds before the accident. This, uh, the my car is the green car and uh, there is the um, um, gold tan car behind me and the motorcyclists behind that car. And this is uh, moments before, uh, two, three seconds before the accident, uh, Mr. Pacheco riding on the bicycle lane, passing that uh, gold car that was behind me.
Um, and and th there is a, a body body cam footage from the <clears throat> from APD and uh, <clears throat> you know one of the officers saying um, that Mr. Pacheco you know wrecked into my green car and there is a discussion that ensues and you know one officer says yeah the person who rear ends is always responsible. Imagine wrecking these guys. No. <laughs> oh my God. That's why I, when you got here, were you like, what the heck? Actually, he wrecked into that Did he? Yeah. It's, if you hit from behind, it's always their fault. It's too cool. Okay, but he said he pulled in front of it. Way back here by the gas station. Oh. That's why, did you hear what I said as soon as I rolled up to lighten the mood? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Like, He's gonna give me a ride. Yeah. Oh, like, I was like, whoa, it's a buggy here. Yeah, but I have a cord, yeah, but I don't have that. And I think it is the <clears throat> the main investigative officer, and you know she's trying to deny my request for pressing charges for Mr. Pacheco punching me in the face. <laughs> in the area of the 8017 Bell Puppies. Okay. Okay. So did he want to press charges? Yeah. Oh. So I'm going to tell him that, remind Lieutenant, you said that you did tell him you pressed him up to 17. Cool. And you're going to have to do a sub I'm already almost up, that's fine. Is that your backup right there? No, it's his. Hello. So that was all the um, presentation I had. I, <clears throat> I don't know um, if I still have any time. Sir, uh, you're at six minutes and 20 seconds remaining. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I think, you know, and, and, and um, so the, the officer, you know, asked me, and, I, you know, from the time the, of the accident until the officers arrived, I was sitting in my car and, you know, I was being harassed and such. Um, <clears throat> even the 911 operator heard that and, you know, he wanted to talk to the people around me on the speaker um, and, and, and then the officer came and you know she you know one of the first things she asked me was uh, if I wanted to press charges to which I said yes um, and then you know she went back <coughs> back and forth and uh, you know some point she came back and said well he said you know he was on the ground and such and you know then she asked me to identify him I mean you know, I mean, I had, you know, okay, I had, I had been rear-ended, I stopped, you know, and, and I saw somebody walking back, um, you know, barely, I'm trying to, you know, take the keys out and unbuckle myself. Um, and, 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 you know, then this person comes by and he punched me. I mean, you know, and at some point I try to, you know, block him. And, you know, all I could, I mean, remember and see is his face. And the officer is asking me to identify him. I mean, I could tell him, you know, he was a heavy set person. Um, so then she said, yeah, you know, um, you cannot identify him. And then, you know, I'm still sitting in the car and the officers are behind my car and talking. And, you know, I look in my rear view mirror and I see the person who punched me. And I, you know, I turn around and yell that the officers, that's the guy who punched me. And, you know, she asked me to turn around and which I did twice. Um, and, and then, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, my request for uh, pressing charges were, was not followed through and the police report was totally wrong. Uh, it, I mean, you know, some of the, you know, one point it says, 
and, and, and also the report claims that I said I was going straight, regardless if I was going straight or turning, uh, you know, there is only one lane for motorized vehicles. Um, and uh, so, you know, he was at fault anyway. And, and also, I mean, you know, you know, he was in violation of number of traffic rules. Um, I even uh, submitted the city traffic code, you know, which says uh, motorized vehicles are not allowed in the bicycle lane except for making a right turn when you have to intersect the uh, bicycle lane. Um, so, I mean, you know, he, he was passing a vehicle that's on the, um, uh, um, on the right, uh, riding on the shoulder of the road or the bicycle lane. Um, and, you know, obviously he was speeding. Uh, matter of fact, in the one of the 911 call, calls he made, uh, he makes an um, admission to driving, I think, uh, 45 to 50 or just 50. I mean, you know, the speed limit there is like 35. So, you know, given his speed and, you know, he wasn't apparently not paying attention. Um, and, and then, you know, this claim about a funeral. I mean, you know, you have to have a police escort, you know, if you're going through traffic and all that, you know, just because uh, you're a motorcyclist, you cannot, uh, you know, block and direct traffic. That's illegal. And I mean, you know, imagine if there was a bicyclist, you know, that person would have got really hurt. You know, these people riding motorcycles on the uh, bicycle lane. And from, for all intentive purposes, you know, it looks like a car parade, if anything. So, but I mean, you know, people, you know, break the law and everything, but the, the thing that got me the most is the police report. I mean, how can a police officer make those claims? I was just flabbergasted. I mean, just from the, where the damage is to the vehicle, you know, Geico, my insurance company said right from the beginning, uh, it's the other person's fault and then, you know, learning that there is only one lane for uh, motorized vehicles, they couldn't believe the police report. And, and, you know, because of this faulty police report, you know, it took me, I think, almost like 10 months or something for to get, you know, get uh, damages for my vehicle. And matter of fact, I mean, you know, first, you know, I actually submitted all this information, including the city traffic code to the um, uh, local police substation where these officers were from, yeah, including the video uh, camera footage, you know, from the security camera um, that, that I acquired from the neighborhood. I mean, to be honest, you know, at that point, I didn't think, you know, the police would fabricate a police report with um, uh, let, let me stop you right there for just a minute. I know you only have a few minutes. <clears throat> but you, you continue to refer to the police report. There was two reports. There was an offense report and there was an accident. Could you let me know what exactly you're referring to when you said you were flab fabricated at the false um, information in the report. Are you referring to the accident? And if so, what part of that accident? The accident report, yes, ma'am. I mean, you know, saying that I change lanes is one of them. I mean, you know, I cannot change lanes. You know, there is only one lane, um, you know, to begin with. So, the, you know, there has to be at least two lanes for motorized vehicles to make a lane change. And also, you know, I mean, I was rear-ended and the report actually says that, you know, front to rear accident. Okay, so when you say that there's false information in the report, are you talking about changing lane because you were driving down a one lane street? Is yes, that the only Is that the only information 
that you're referring to that's incorrect in this report or is there well, well also also you know the fact blaming me for the accident when i was rear ended does it blame you sir or just we're we're in that report because usually they just state uh, what was said to them where in the report are you saying that it says uh, it says you know i um I'm sorry, um, somebody was going to speak, but you know, I don't have the report in front of me, but I, I do remember it says, uh, I was at fault for the accident, um, reasons being inattention and also improper lane change, you know, both of which are not true. I mean, it's demonstrably right. false. Okay, yes, a lot of accidents do state that. Okay, okay, sir, <clears throat> that was the end of my questions. Thank you, ma'am. That's um, a great question. You know, Mr. Sanji. Yes, sir. I've been on this board for two and a half years, and I have never seen a case laid out so clearly um, as yours. I commend you on that because it was very clear to follow. I and that. Uh, first of all, I apologize that this happened, especially to a taxpaying citizen. Um, but I, I can follow what you were saying. And I just definitely heard. Um, thank you for this. I, I've never seen it laid out like this, very plain and simple. I'm assuming you were able to get the video from IPRA or something like that to get you know public access video of the OBR, OBRD and stuff like that. Um, but everything that you laid out, um, I understand now. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Uh, One last that. question. Yes. Um, when it came to your initial um, when you went to the appeal and you had the letter that was sent from the, from the agency uh, with their findings, the findings letter, what did that state to you? What, what did that mean to you when you got that before you decided to appeal? Um, I mean, you know, I think the, my, you know, primary request was the correction of the police report, but the, for some reason, um, the, 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 the letter I received, um, you know, after the investigation didn't even address the, um, the, the accident report shortcomings in it. Understood. So, yes, sir. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, thank you. Uh, we appreciate that presentation and uh, let's see if there's any other um, comments. Um, <clears throat> is there any, is there an officer here, uh, Director Ewing? You're on. Looking at the list, I do not believe I see either of the officers who are the subject of the complaint. However, I do believe that Commander Sean Waite is here on behalf of APD for their 10 minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Commander, good evening. Thank you, Chair Friends. Uh, Mr. Sanjay, thanks for uh, presenting this to us. I just want to give a, a brief intro as to what my position is in this case. So I'm the, uh, I'm the discipline reviewer for APD. So I have a fairly limited role in that I review discipline findings and potential discipline actions on behalf of APD, whether that's the CPOA, or uh, internal affairs, either force or professional standards. So uh, in, in reviewing this case, all I reviewed was, uh, and all I'm required to review is the findings by the CPOA. So I, I did not conduct a, a review of the accident. Uh, that's, not, that's not what my role is, but my role is Excuse to- Excuse me, Commander. Yes, sir. Um, fading in and out on my video, I don't know if that's, Happy yeah, I think everybody you, else. you turn your head a little bit, um, wherever your microphone is on your wire, on, on your cord, it may be. Yeah, Mr. Nixon, it's on my, it's on my computer, so I'll try to stick closer to the computer. You guys will get an extra large view of my head if I do that. <laughs> okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, unfortunately, my, the mic on my computer is not great, but... Uh, this is better. So, yes, sir, let me, let me start over again. Uh, Mr. Wartell, now, now I'm so close, I can't see anybody's names without my reading glasses. So, um, Sorry, so again, 
No, sir. Again, my, my position as the reviewer of the findings and the proposed discipline, it, it, so my role is fairly limited. Um, and in, in this case, I reviewed the uh, investigation that was conducted by the CPOA, and I reviewed their findings. Uh, again, uh, as we review this, this evidence, we're looking at a preponderance of the evidence standard, which is 50%. And I felt that uh, the findings, I, I concurred with the findings that were made by uh, CPOA, which was exonerated for the allegation of violation of the reporting offense, which is a, a SOP 260. Essentially that says that they'll conduct a proper preliminary investigation. And then there was another finding that fell under uh, SOP 1-1, which had to do with uh, essentially treating everybody equally uh, with ir irrespective of uh, race, creed, religion, et cetera. That one was unfounded because there was no evidence that police officers had discriminated against Mr. Sunzi. So that, that, uh, that's as far as my review goes. I don't review the accident report that, that or the, the incident report. Those would be conducted by a supervisor in the field who manages the two officers. So with respect to APD, we concurred with the board on this investigation. Director French or, or Madam Chair, that's, uh, that's all I have now. Chair French, you may be muted. Thank you, I sure was. Okay, thank you, Commander Waits, we appreciate that. Um, uh, Director Ewing, is there any comment from the agency on this? There is. Thank you, Chair French, members of the board. Um, I just want to start by reminding what the standard is on an appeal. On an appeal, the appellant must demonstrate that the agency either misapplied policy, uh, applied the uh, policy in an arbitrary, capricious or manner or uh, engaged in an abuse of discretion, or that the findings were contrary to the facts. And I don't believe that we have any of that here. The first thing that we heard Mr. Jayawardana uh, complain about was what he calls the physical impossibility of um, what is described in the accident report as apparent contributing factors to the accident, um, driver inattention and an improper lane change. In Mr. Jayawardana's statement that he attached to his complaint, he stated himself on page one of five of that statement um, in the middle of paragraph two, I activated my right turn signal, continued to brake, and merged into the bicycle lane while checking the bicycle lane in preparation for a right hand turn onto Aspen. That merging into the bicycle lane would constitute the lane change referred to in the accident report. In terms of the description of um, driver one, Mr. Jayawardana going straight, review of the multiple lapel videos that came from this scene showed that when officers first showed up, both the motorcyclist, Mr. Pacheco, and Mr. Jayawardana were still both fully on San Pedro. Mr. Jayawardana was um, just before the corner, but was not yet turned or even in the middle of the turn. He was still on um, San Pedro, apparently moving straight. Officers are allowed to report based on not just statements, but on their own observations of a scene and the officer would have had a responsibility to report on her observations of that scene. So I don't believe that that is an improper assessment of the facts either when it comes to how our agency in the course of its investigation um, applied both the facts available to us uh, to the policies to find that there was no violation of SOP. Um, the fact that there was a settlement really doesn't touch on whether there was a violation of SOP, and that is where we, where this agency and the board 
have to focus. It is not our job as an agency in conducting an investigation to relitigate the facts, to reinvestigate, to tell the police department, you need to go back and change these police reports. You need to go back and press charges. You need to go back and change the way charging decisions may have been made. That is not the function of this agency. That is not the purpose of these investigations. Um, in terms of the policies that were um, investigated, I found I, I heard nothing in today's presentation as to what policies might have been misapplied. I have not heard um, anything as to um, there may have been something arbitrary, capricious, or an abuse of discretion. Um, there's also a statement earlier about a refusal to press charges. I do want, from my experience as a public defender, to explain how charges being pressed happens. Um, because this accident did not happen in the presence of officers, there could not have been an arrest made at the scene. There's something known as the misdemeanor arrest rule. For an officer to arrest without a warrant on a misdemeanor that is not a domestic violence case, uh, because there are specific laws allowing an arrest without the officer witnessing it, but anything that's not a domestic violence case has to happen in the presence of the officer. Otherwise, the officer cannot engage in a warrantless arrest. A summons must be issued. And in this case, the officers investigated whether a summons would be an appropriate thing to do. The initial gentleman who, off, who appeared um, on, this, on the case, who is, uh, a portion of whose lapel video was shown by Mr. Jayawardana, um, did speak both to Mr. Pacheco and then to Mr. Jayawardana. Um, then the two female officers who showed up at the scene, one spoke with Mr. Jayawardana and did have a conversation with him about identifying the person who had punched him. Um, in his conversation with her and in later conversations with our investigator, what he reported was that initially his sight was so blurry, he couldn't, con he couldn't really see his phone in front of him to call 911, that he had managed to contact his partner because she was a frequently dialed number, and then that later he had managed to carefully dial 911, um, but that that had uh, been impacted, um, his vision had been impacted by the blows he had received in the incident. Um, when he was asked to identify who had engaged in the violence, um, as he admitted, what he told the officers was he was heavy set. Um, I do believe he may have also described a black shirt. I don't remember if that was the 911 call or to the officer who responded. The problem is there were a number of gentlemen on that scene who were heavy set and wearing black shirts. And the officer to whom he gave that report even made the statement, um, while she was away talking to the other officer and they were making charging decisions um, without more, without more of a description, like he's wearing such and such plant pants because black shirt was not a sufficient identifier um, and heavy set was not a sufficient identifier. They could not charge because officers are required to have probable cause to charge. And probable cause means cause to believe that a specific individual probably committed a crime. And without a more positive identification, they did not have that specific individual. Um, I should also note that Mr. Jarwardana's partner did show up, had to be um, asked to cease um, approaching the car and trying to interject into the investigation. And it, what, it did not appear to officers that until after that person had talked to Mr. Jayawardana that, and perhaps even shown the videos that she had been taking around the scene, it did not appear from what I saw in the videos that, they, uh, that a positive identification was made until after that intervention. Um, given those facts known to the officers, I do not believe that um, the SOPs were not followed. I do not believe that they were misapplied in this case. No one is claiming that this didn't happen. No one is claiming through these findings that this was not a frightening, traumatic, and expensive experience. I 
I have no doubt that extensive damage was done to his car. I have no doubt that this was deeply traumatizing and painful and frightening to go through. However, it is not the part of CPOA in investigations to try to make that part of this right, unfortunately. It's not, just as it's not our place to force an officer to make charging decisions that they don't believe they have probable cause to make. It is only for us to decide whether or not police procedures have been followed or not. And in the investigation we conducted on a, on a review of the totality of the evidence and on a review of what those policies were by the preponderance of the evidence, we could not find violations. And I do not believe that um, policies were misapplied, that we did not um, apply things to the facts properly or that anything arbitrary, capricious or an abuse of discretion had here as such, I believe the findings need to stay. Thank you. I stand ready for questions. Chair French, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, Director Ewing, in the beginning of your discussion, you described a, a three-legged stool on which um, an appeal could be based. That Would you please describe that third leg once more? Of course. Um, the options are, and let me pull the exact language for you. Um, that third leg is that the findings and recommendations were not consistent with the record evidence. So um, there are three reasons to grant an appeal. That th the, the first two are the misapplication of um, policy in the evaluation of the complaint. The second is findings or recommendations were arbitrary, capricious, or constituted an abuse of discretion. That final leg that you're talking about, the third option for upholding an appeal, is making a finding that the findings and recommendations in that letter were not consistent with the record evidence. And the record evidence consists of um, everything that went into the investigation. Well, and, and then you proceeded to describe all of the individual details of the investigation, which to me indicates that it's that third leg of the stool on which this appeal is based. That is the understanding I have from Mr. Jairwardana's um, presentation because I did not hear anything from him about um, the facts having been plot, uh, the policy having been applied, um, misapplied uh, to the evidence or uh, that he believed that anything was arbitrary, capricious, or an abuse of discretion. Based on the arguments I heard, that was the impression I got of what he was fo focusing his appeal but, on. But what if the fact, what if the apparent facts from the investigation contradicted the police report and the final conclusions? If the, that's not a policy issue, that's a no, factual issue. And if that is what the board believes uh, to be the case, then the board could find um, that they felt the findings and evidence, the findings and recommendations were not consistent with that record evidence, which is that third criteria. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Yes, and sir. I, and I appreciate that. Thank of you. Of course. Are there any other questions? Of director no, there's no other questions. Um, I think that a lot of this is interpretation. Um, it's not, if I look at the facts and look at what everything that Mr. Sanji has, has presented here, um, it's pretty obvious that some of the facts are, have been misconstrued or um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of bias um, on, on what's happening here. So. I, I think that I find that I find that a bit concerning. Okay, uh, Member Nixon, we're going to give Mr. Uh, Sanji five minutes uh, for uh, for closing and response. Oh, all right. Well, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. 
and and you know i i still um i mean you know like that gentleman just mentioned you know i mean i felt that bias and you know if you when you look at the body cam footage you know you see that again and again and i don't know what influenced this uh, the specific officer um i think that's officer lopez um i mean you know she tried to uh safeguard this gentleman and you know and and i mean so you know i i merged to uh the bicycle lane and accident doesn't happen right away and you know i mean uh, you i mean the the location of the accident and 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 who was behind me and uh and and this is a group of people um who were blocking and directing traffic um i mean you know everything is wrong and 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 the police report is one sided and, and also it's incorrect simply put um matter of fact you know the i waited and waited and none of the officers um the, the you know came and got my account of the accident and that bothered me but you know i mean i thought you know this is such a simple accident rear end accident in one lane traffic even though uh, uh director referred to the bicycle lane as another lane uh, you know the the motorcyclists are not allowed to ride in that lane but i had the right to intersect the bicycle lane because i was making a um right turn and and of course you know there is that as an engineer i can tell you there is a <clears throat> weight and the velocity the momentum uh you know from the bicycle transferred to my car so my car was pushed forward and also you know when you get rear ended um i mean you know you're in the middle of a turn you know <laughs> you're not going to you know try to turn your vehicle you're trying to stop as soon as you can okay thank you um we appreciate that um and with that um i'm going to ask for a motion that we go to in, go into closed session for deliberation of this appeal according so to Second. Once again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. I have a motion. Uh, I made the motion in a second. Ms. Barella, will you take the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nick? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Thank you. And Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimously.
Thank you. Is there a motion that we come out of the executive session? So moved. Second. Second. Ms. Barella, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Member Nixon? Go ahead. Um, okay. Member Rayner? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. And oh, Member Nixon's back. Did you, Member yes. Nixon? Okay. That motion passed unanimously. Thank you. And for the record, I just want it stated that nothing was discussed in our executive session except what's on the agenda, the appeal information. And with that, I'm going to make a motion that the board accept the PowerPoint uh, information that was provided uh, by Mr. Sanji, um, that we accept that. It was proper and accepted. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Motion and a second. Member Barella, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Thank you. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. And that motion passed unanimously. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Member Crawford. I'd like to make a motion uh, that the board stay the appeal that we just heard pending further investigation and that we ask the agency to conduct further investigation, which I will detail in a letter and return the results to us by 10 days before the November uh, meeting of the board. I'll second that. Any discussion? Yeah, if you don't mind, Chair, um, I'd like to just go over uh, yeah. what it is that we're going to ask uh, and this coming with, uh, with the, the reassurance that I will put this into written form and uh, send it to the director as well. Um, there's seven sort of specific things that we would like the agency to look into further. The first under SOP 2-46, uh, we'd like the agency to investigate why there is not a diagram uh, for the traffic accident. Uh, in question here, under SOP 2-60, we would like the agency to look into the, the reason that the officer did not conduct further investigation on the, the possible battery that occurred in this case. Uh, and why as well it wasn't designed uh, for follow-up investigation. Uh, under SOP 2-46, we'd like the agency to investigate uh, how the report contains the conclusion that there was inattentive driving on the part of the complainant, uh, but that there was no error on the part of the motorcyclist. Um, uh, number, our, our fourth item, sorry, my own handwriting is bad enough that I'm trying to figure out what I meant here. Um, under, I think, SOP 2-60, it seems that there's some information that someone may have actually expressed to a lieutenant that they had hit the complainant. Uh, we'd like the agency to look into that and, and why that was not uh, something that was further considered in the investigation. Um, under SOP 2-60, I believe as well, uh, we'd like the agency to investigate why a 911 caller uh, who independently witnessed some of these events uh, was not interviewed by APD as a witness. We're also curious why the agency didn't uh, reach out to that, or at least attempt to reach out to that person. Um, also under SOP 2-60, uh, we'd like the agency to look into the questioning uh, of the motorcyclists involved. There was a large group of them. It seems that they were questioned in mass and not individually. Uh, we'd like the agency to consider whether or not that was in line with policy. Um, and finally, under SOP 115, uh, we would like the agency to further investigate uh, whether or not there is any possible bias in the investigation of this incident. Uh, something that came up in particular there is uh, the change in tone and demeanor of the officers when addressing uh, the complainant versus when addressing the motorcyclists, and particularly the officers attempt to uh, make friendly with the motorcyclists and, and perhaps not with the motorist. Uh, 
Uh, we'd also like the agency to consider any other violations of policy that they might discover uh, in the process of addressing those questions. Um, and I'll just repeat, uh, I plan to put this into a letter so it's a little more coherent and get that to the director. And we would like uh, the results of that investigation by 10 days before our November board meeting. We have a motion and a second. Um, any more discussion? Ms. Barella, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you, and that motion passed unanimously. Thank you, and I, uh, I just wanna say, because it is now, 7.30 that we will take a 7.34. We will take approximately a 15 minute break and let's reconvene around 7.45. That's an 11 minute break. I said approximately 15. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, then we'll continue with uh, item number nine, discussion updates and possible actions. Uh, we'll go with 9A, PPRB policy with no recommendations. Member Crawford. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the policies and procedures subcommittee <laughs> met just recently uh, to review policies recently approved by ABD's PPRB. Uh, if it feels like I am, am uh, giving you some filler here, uh, I am. I'm just trying to find the uh, document to screen share with you real quick. Bear with me for just a moment. Here it is. Okay, so there was a set of seven policies. Let me hit share screen here. So there's a set of seven policies uh, that came out of the uh, PPRB meeting. Um, our comment on these policies is due by September 30th. It's our 30 day, the end of our 30 day comment window. Um, the policies and procedures subcommittee uh, is not recommending any changes on any of these policies. Um, so I will uh, just give you a quick, a quick rundown of, of what policies were affected. 1-41 uh, evidence unit uh, largely just updates to the language in that policy change. 1-56 horse mounted unit uh, is also largely changes to the language. One item of interest there uh, is some uh, material on how use of force policy applies to the horse mounted unit. And specifically, uh, I think this has always been the case but the new version of the policy makes it clearer that uh, unintended or uncommanded interactions between a horse and an individual are not considered a use of force. Um, that said, that doesn't mean that they are not investigated. Uh, they are, but it goes through the chain of command and through city risk management rather than uh, through the IA use of force process. 1-65 um, Metropolitan Court Protection Unit uh, only very minor changes as well. The most substantial thing there is not so much a, a reduction as it is kind of a rearranging of the mandatory complement of officers to the court protection unit. 3-12 awards and recognitions was updated mostly to give uh, definitions and criteria for all of the awards, which had not previously been in policy. 3-25, the bid process. Um, had only minor changes. I think those were mostly just to address some details of the new CBA. 3-34, the training committee policy. Uh, this policy sets up the training committee, uh, which meets biannually in order to review and make recommendations on uh, APD's training program. And then 3-44, review of completed administrative investigation cases. Um, this policy is interesting because it is sort of the APD counterparts to our own policies and procedures as far as uh, laying out how APD handles uh, cases that it reviews after CPOA investigation, and similarly how cases investigated by IA are handed over to the CPOA for review. Um, mostly only minor changes to this policy. The two substantial things uh, of note to me at least, uh, number one, this policy used to have a large portion of the CPOA's own investigation process in it. Um, that didn't make a lot of sense since, of course, we have our own policy that we're governed by. So that was removed. Uh, what stays is just a paragraph uh, clarifying that CPOA's investigations are, of course, governed by CPOA's own policy and not by APD SOPs. Um, and there had also formerly been a requirement uh, in that policy that all reviews of completed administrative investigations get a final sign off from a member of APD's executive leadership. Um, I suspect that was only ever a pretty kind of a pro forma rubber stamp exercise. That requirement has been removed. Um, what replaces it uh, is just a, the discretion to review on the part of those executives. Um, so, for example, the chief of police or the superintendent of reform can pull a completed investigation and review it uh, if they so choose, but they're not required to sign off uh, on all of them anymore. Um, so that's the full set of changes. Uh, I would like to move that the board um, 
and this is just in line with how we've done this before. I'd like to move that the board direct uh, Ali Abbasi, CPOA's data analyst, to communicate to APD that we do not have any recommendations on these policies. Uh, oh, go ahead. Did you second it, Eric? I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. And with that, uh, I'd like to discuss one little, little thing. Um, I'd like for Ollie to put in 3-34 uh, that the board is expecting the follow-up with this subcommittee to include a board member. Yeah, I'd be happy to take that uh, as a friendly <clears throat> amendment. And uh, th there, there is some discussion of how CPOA's input will be incorporated into this training review process. It's not in the policy yet. Um, I was kind of given the impression it probably will be in the future, but we should uh, we should nag on that point because definitely it would be good to have that happen. Well, what they said is they're thinking about coming up with a subcommittee, and then they had said somebody from the agency, and I. I told them, no, the training mostly is for the board, mandated to the board, and the board represents the citizens, the community. So absolutely, if they have a subcommittee, we may not have a vote, but we need to have a voice. And that was discussed. <clears throat> so we had a motion and a, and a, a second. Ms. Barella, will you take the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Thank you. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. And that motion passed unanimously. Thank you. And then we'll move on to reformatting how data, uh, excuse me, 9B, reforming, formatting how David, data is provided to the board. Member Nixon? Okay, so had a meeting yesterday uh, with um, APD, the um, data folks at APD, and so uh, we we kind of confirmed that we we're on the same page. So going forward, they'll be able to place all of our cases in one folder, um, and that would be one link that's pretty consistent. That way, we're not having to click different places for different things. Um, they can provide all the all the materials that we would need to to look at a use of force case that's um, within the CASA, uh, according to the CASA. And um, the idea here is that we have one single place where we can go for any of the, the uh, cases that we, we need to, uh, to look at. The second piece of that, um, Patty, and we'll have to have another conversation with that is as far as the, um, the uh, backlog cases or the, or the older cases that we're trying to look at with use of force. Um, they want to make sure that they can place them in the right place, but it it appears that it's going to take a bit of time for them to do that um, because of where they're placed and getting those consolidated. So um, again, we'll be we'll be talking with them and working with them uh, in that respect. Uh, they did take your Excel spreadsheet and are looking at that. There may have been some questions that they have that can be answered fairly quickly, but they just want to confirm that they're on the right uh, track with those. And um, what I suspect it would, it, well, what the timeline was within the next um, month or so, we should have those uh, cases consolidated where we'll start seeing cases populated on the link. Uh, yourself and my, me and you will be uh, sent a link um, from, the, from the data folks uh, to test and make sure that we can access it with all that information. And um, you can disseminate that to whoever you want. Of course, you, we can disseminate to the, that to the rest of the board to test it. And make sure that we can access those those tests, um, or excuse me, those cases. And I'll take any questions if you have, but missed anything. Well, thank you, Eric, for taking the lead on that. I really appreciate it. I would like to get these uh, moving on the a special meeting for these cases. So, will you respond to them and let them know as soon as they have ten cases in this place uh, yep. to notify you, and yes. we will for that special meeting. I sure can. Yeah, they can definitely do that since they're working on moving those and getting those done now. When, we, when they hit the 10, I'll definitely let you know and we can get a, get scheduled. And then again, they will be adding all the cases until we're we're you know caught up or we, we have everything in the right place uh, as we're designing it. Okay. Yeah. As soon as we have 10, let's let's get started. Because you know, the longer the wait, the further we're getting behind. <clears throat> okay. 
All right, thank you. Let's move on to 9C. Uh, this is the MOU and the update on the letter to the DOJ, and that would be uh, Councillor Gooch. Thank you, Chair French. Uh, I had provided a draft letter to Member Crawford that I believe has been provided to the board, but I defer to Member Crawford on that. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the proposed letter or make any changes if anyone would like. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and uh, I apologize. I sent that letter out very shortly before this meeting. So um, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, it's, it's a couple pages. Most of that's kind of background. The gist of it uh, is that this is a letter to Elizabeth Martinez with the Department of Justice uh, asking for assistance with this MOU, uh, which as you all know, or as, as those of us who have been around know at least, um, has been kind of stuck for quite a while now. So what is the remedy we're asking for? Um, you know, I think maybe uh, Ms. Gooch can, can speak better to what exactly we might get, but I think the general, the general gist is that we're hoping for maybe some pressure to be applied from the DOJ side uh, on this issue. Um, Chair French and, and Member Crawford, yeah, the idea is to raise it as an issue so that then we can seek involvement from the monitor and, if necessary, the court regarding the CASA compliant issues. Okay, <clears throat> so do we have any timelines? Because um, this has been going on and on and on and on and on and on. You know, I'm, I'm a little frustrated. Um, and so I, I appreciate doing this letter. And as Tina said, so we're gonna ask the DOJ and then if they don't, then we have to go, you know, take it to the court or whatever. Are, do we have any timelines here? Are, you know, because we don't want this to be another six months, another year. Um, Chair guess, French, they, yes, go ahead. Uh, member, and I'm sorry, my internet is getting funky, so I apologize if I spoke over you. Um, there's no timeline other than raising it for the IMR reporting period regarding the compliance issue for the CASA with the monitor team. And it, we lost you, Tina. Member French, um, yes. Just this is uh, part of the discussion as well, and it, it, you know this is really dovetails into uh, what Jesse's represent uh, presenting here. So you know how OBRD videos uh, can be requested through IPRA. Yes. Um, one of the questions that I had was about redacted video versus unredacted video, and whether or not we had authority to see that. Um, as it turns out, we may want to also <clears throat> have a discussion uh, amongst the board members about how, how we would feel about setting up a workflow or a process where we would IPRA um, any, any uh, OBRD footage that we deem necessary for a case and how, what that impact would look like, what that would look like for the board to have a, a standing IPRA process in place. Councilor Gooch, uh, is she back? Can can we hear her now? I see her. I'm here. We lost you again, Tina. <clears throat> well, unfortunately for Gov TV, I don't like to go out of order, and we're on nine C. And 9D also is Councillor Gooch. Um, <clears throat> I think she's catching up now. Oh. Is she? Yeah, just saw her move. What we can perhaps do too is uh, kind of whatever the case is, I'd like to get this letter sent out since this is kind of our our next step in sort of escalating this. Um, so I, I think, 
unless anyone would really like to get more info from from Councillor Gooch uh, first, I would like to move that we direct uh, Ms. Gooch to send this letter uh, to Elizabeth Martinez, and it'll be copied to the board, to the city council, I think to a couple of other uh, couple of other parties. I'll second that. Is there any other discussion? Okay, Member Varela, Varela, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you, and that motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Then we'll go on to um, 9D. Is Councillor Gooch, is she back on? I see her. I apologize. I, I found a different internet. Um, I, I apologize. I will keep my camera off in the hopes that that doesn't strain my Wi-Fi further. Um, I am sorry. I am wasting you guys' time. What, what question is on the table? And I can answer it. Well, we moved on. So we're now we're on the uh, uh, training status update. It's all your counselor. Thank you, Member Wartel. Um, we are we are getting uh, closer to having the trainings all ready for us to provide some live trainings to the board on the updated initial training as well as annual training, depending on where you are in your process as board members. We are now just waiting on the testing portions of those trainings to be approved. And once they are, I will work with uh, Director Ewing on getting live trainings ready for you all based on your availability and schedule. Um, I recently spoke with the city and they have a certain number of items that they are working on as well. And they are working through the process of having it approved with the monitor. And Director Ewing also is aware that the agency has a few items and we are all working in the process with the hopes we can start rolling that out for you all as soon as possible. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Just a little more to add to that, I think. Uh, and that's that <clears throat> um, Director Ewing, Councillor Gooch, um, Ali and I had a meeting with the monitor to discuss the training issue. And I, I think it was reasonably productive in that Dan Giacquino, I don't think, is going to press us within the timelines to get the training that APD has not provided yet, uh, so that it will be noted in the layout of, our, of the training that we've completed that um, all of the that there were there are certain trainings that we simply can't get and we await APDs providing them for us. Is that fair, Councillor? Chair French Member Wartel, yes. And we are also working to figure out what said trainings are and if they are available, where to get access to them. I just have one question for both of you. So now that you met with the DOJ on this. So in the ordinance and the DOJ all agree that if board members don't get their required training in a certain amount of time, you can be removed from the board just for that. But yet there are required classes that APD has to provide that they haven't provided since I've been on the board and nothing is being said about that. The only thing being talked about is if the board members don't complete theirs, they're off the board. So, you know, that to me is unfair because they're saying as long as it's APD that doesn't provide it, you're okay. You don't have to have it done in the required time. But if it's a class that you are, you do have access, then the timelines um, are effective. So that's just, just something that I, I, I think that isn't fair to the board. Um, it's giving a pass to one and not to the other. 
considering we all volunteers and the um, Citizen Police Academy is uh, some board members just can't devote 12 weeks, twice a week. And so I just see this as, as them saying, you know, giving one person a pass and being hard on the volunteers. So that's something I'd like for you guys to maybe bring to their attention. Um, either it's straight across the board or it's not. I think that we emphasize that rather clearly, don't you, Counselor? And that Monitor Gia Quinta was uh, not unsympathetic. Chair French, Member Wartell, I agree. And I just want to be clear, DOJ was not at the meeting that Member Wartell was mentioning. It was just the monitor. And the no, I don't think I mentioned DOJ, did I? No, I, I just want to make clear that this was a meeting with the monitor um, mm -hmm. to go over the training spreadsheet. Um, but we have articulated the, the concern to the monitor team and the Department of Justice that watches these meetings will hear Member French, your concerns reiterated. Several times, actually. Well, it's not just the concerns of APD not providing them. My concern is the ordinance and everybody is, you know, applying the rules to the board. If the training or the, you know, the ride alongs are there that if you don't do them, you're off the board. But the same, at the same time, these classes that are required by, for us, but AD, APD doesn't provide them, then those are overlooked. You get a pass, you know? <clears throat> But in a lot of ways, that's in our best interest. Well, yeah, I'm not saying it's I'm not saying it's not, but I'm just saying, you know, let's let's just be consistent here. You know, if you're going to apply the rules to the board, then the rules have to be applied to agency that have to provide the training also. So what's the punishment there? Are we going to uh, discontinue the police academy if they don't provide the training? I, I mean, I, I don't know no, how to make it some. I'm saying, I'm saying for a trade off, we get a waiver on the CPA, Citizen Police Academy. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Okay. That, that's why I bring it up. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, thank you to 9E and the NACO conference. Um, I hope that all board members have received their information. And I personally, personally, want to apologize to board members about this conference. Um, I did start contacting the agency the 1st of August because this conference is a year in advance. Um, I contacted the NACO myself. Uh, I sent member Crawford the email that I received from them saying that the rooms at the Riddasat, the block rooms had sold out, that they had rooms at the Aloft and that those were going fast. So I used my personal credit card to uh, reserve rooms for the board because I wanted to ensure that we were somewhere close, we were near. Um, and so, you know, I know that some board members just got their confirmation, just got their travel this week. And, and you know, I assure you that that will not happen next year. I mean, in the past, um, you know, the agency, Ed would tell us in advance and put it in his executive director reports, I do believe. But even if that doesn't happen, I guarantee you in January, I'm gonna start asking who wants to attend so we can get this done in a timely manner. Because I know some of you have jobs. Member Rayner, Member Crawford, you have jobs and I brought that up. People have jobs, they have to ask for vacation. We need to get this done. So the city does, have, it's a long process through the procurement uh, process for the city, but that's been in like that for years. So I just want to personally apologize that it's so late and you're getting your confirmation. And I will, I will guarantee you that will not happen next year. Not, a, well, not Patty, if I'm still chairing. Well, Patty, for the, for the, I think me and Mike were going to go virtual. And right. Mike, did you, did you get a confirmation yet or anything? I have gotten nothing. I think mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Ewing said those confirmations will be sent tomorrow for the virtual. You'll Is receive it. Yeah. And I'll be getting into that in my report later in the meeting. All right. Okay. okay, so that's all that we have on 9E. Um, 9F, Councilor Gooch, again, response letter to EFID.
You are muted. Well, I, I see that she's still muted. So I will just say, did all of you read that they're going to have a separate hearing? Oh, there she is, Miss Cooch. I'm sorry, I, I was in. Um, the, the reason I asked for this was just to bring it to the board's attention because there is a hearing coming up and Director Ewing has listed in her report that you all received the anticipated date of that hearing. And I just wanted to make sure that if anyone on the board wanted to make a comment or submit a letter, or join in any kind of letter that the agency was going to submit, that it was on your agenda this evening so that you could meet your OMA requirements and have the opportunity to be heard at the upcoming hearing. I read it and I didn't see anything that I believe the board needs to respond to or comment on. Um, I'll ask our director, did she any, see anything that she felt like the board or the agency needs to comment on? Madam Chair, members of the board, no, I did not. I absolutely concur with that. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll move on to 9G. Um, the uh, Personnel Board uh, Subcommittee did meet. We went over the um, evaluations. I sent the board uh, some red line uh, changes that I had made. They weren't anything significant. Um, we, I crossed out the POB email. I also said about uh, when it said that she needs to hire quickly. I thought that was poor language to put in there. So I put just in a timely manner when there's a position open. Um, I, I, I made small changes like that um, to it. Um, there was a couple other things that I thought that we needed to put. Maybe I'm not sure where, or maybe we'll just tell her these are things we're gonna be looking at. As you know, the, um, we have a training log, but the investigators are also required to have 40 hours of training yearly. And then eight hours after that, we'd like to have like a spreadsheet or I think the, invest, the executive director needs to keep the board uh, informed about the training. Are the investigators being properly trained? You know, because we're a team and we support them, they support us. So we need to know if they're receiving this training, if they're not, um, what can we do to help? Is there training somewhere else they can go to get it? So those are some things that I, I think that need to be included or maybe just we put in our policy to include in the executors, I mean, the uh, director's report, maybe semi-annually. Um, those are things that I think we need to talk about. Um, and I don't know if we put it in the evaluation, but I had brought it up uh, to Ms. Ewing, Director Ewing during the meeting. Um, we wanna know, you know, at the last IMR, um, the investigations um, were not very good. The findings on the investigation, should I say, there was quite a few. So we just wanna know what is she doing to eliminate those type of um, uh, findings? And I think we had talked about that um, Ms. Ewing, and there was a reason why that had happened, given, and it was clearly understandable, and we accept that, but going forward, we just wanted to look at that. So those were the, the only thing, uh, issues, I don't know if all of you looked at it, it was quite a huge um, Excel spreadsheet, then a survey, then this, then that. Uh, we did have uh, Ms. the Ian Soker, the attorney, and then we did have Beverly and Samuels uh, on there, because I wanted to make sure we were doing everything for HR rules and they agreed uh, what we were doing was fine. I do think that if we have this, the survey for the staff that they need to um, send it, do it by survey monkey. I, I think on the last one, it said return to the chair. I don't know if staff would feel comfortable having a, maybe they think the chair is really close to the director and they couldn't speak freely. So we'll find a way to get that done so that they can speak freely on that. The only other issue that I had is that the timelines, um, the um, ordinance and our policy and procedure says it will be done January, it's done on a, you know, a calendar year, we can't do that. Her date of hire is certainly not January, we can't put this off. And so in the meantime, we had said that we would have somebody present it to her, but we also upon agreement with the personnel board and Ian Stoker, because Miss 
uh, Director Ewing is starting, we would do a quarterly, a semi-annual, and then the, the semi-annual and the annual would be formal. The quarterly would not. But just to keep her updated, here's the things we think you're doing well. Here's the things that we think might need improvement. These are the things that we're looking at. Um, let's talk about them. And so we thought that would only be fair to her. She's new to the city and having that quarterly um, review is, is fair. It's open communication. Um, let's all be a team here. No gotchas, no nothing like that. Let's, let's work on it, let's do it. And so we, <clears throat> before we can do that, I needed the board to approve for us to do it quarterly and give Ms. Director Ewing a date, um, the semi-annual, and then the annual. And I would go from her date of hire is how I'd recommend it. I know that I had on here um, that Mr. Stoker was gonna talk about uh, uh, talking to city council. I did talk to him today. I'm sorry he has not contacted city council yet, but we will have to change our policy and procedures and we will have to, maybe uh, Mr. Sylvan's here from city council. We will have to let him know that it will not be done on a calendar year but it will be done based on date of hire for Director Ewing. So um, I guess the first thing I wanna know is, is there a motion to approve the documents that were sent to you with the red line version that I sent today? And like I said, there were small changes. Um, there were some suggestions and I'll bring that up to Ms. Ewing. I don't want to, I don't want her to feel like we're babysitting her but so you know i don't want to put everything make sure everything's in black and white uh but we do want to be explicit on what we what we want here too so um i send them to you i'll be glad to send you a copy uh, director ewing there weren't big changes just you know I, quickly what's quickly i mean you know you don't you just don't put that in the evaluation do it and do it quickly so those, those are just small changes so with that, is there a motion to approve the documents that were sent with the changes that were added? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Barella, will you take the roll? And we have Number discussion. Five. I'm sorry. Discussion, go ahead. I'm, I'm curious if we've never had the quarterly evaluations before that's a fairly big change in the documents. And how formal are those formula, are those quarterly um, evaluations, how formal are those quarterly evaluations going to be? Actually, we've never had the semi-annual either, have we? No, good question. So this was brought up in the personnel. Um, the, we will not do the surveys to the staff or to the board on the quarterly or semi-annually. On the quarterly and semi-annually, we will go over the expectations um, and how we feel like she's doing on those expectations that we give her. It so will not- no, I'm sorry, what's the difference between the quarterly and the semi-annually? There's not gonna be a difference in the quarterly and the semi-annually, other than it's really not gonna be evaluation, it's gonna be a review. And I think it's that's not fair. official. It won't be official evaluation, but, it's, but it will it's be documented. If, I'm if sorry. There's but, going to be no difference. You might as well just have quarterly evaluations leading to the annual review, to the annual evaluation. Quarterly reviews leading to the annual evaluation. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm good with that. Director Ewing, are you good with that? I am, I have no problem with that. And you understand, the, the board members understand why we wanna do it like that. I mean, and once she's been here, you know, we can go to semi-annual or annual, but right now we need to, I think we need more often review. No, I think all the discussions are very valuable. Yes. I'm not, I'm not questioning that at all. So my motion, so you said, why don't we have Quarterly simply review. have quarterly reviews leading up to the annual evaluation. And those are informal discussions. Okay. 
You said informal? Yeah. Mm. Well, that's what they are. You're not, you're not collecting data. You've already said you're not going to do the surveys. Yeah, and you're not going to, you're not, you're not going to record anything either. So. No, we're not going to record anything. But just let me run a scenario by you. So, say there's something, and we say, uh, Director Ewing, um, we just don't feel like you're fulfilling uh, these expectations. Um, and we, you know, we tell her that quarterly until her yearly evaluation. I think that those somewhere should be noted if she's excelling at something. You those can always put that in the letter. Say that again. I, I said you can always put that in a letter. Okay. Okay. All right. I just don't want any surprises or anything with anybody. Okay. So I'll amend my motion to say that we do quarterly re reviews leading up to the annual evaluation right and who who second that i did so so moved okay and let me open for discussion again do we want to include the dates of the quarterly evaluation in the motion I think we're probably good if I understood right to just say that they're going to be, you know, three, six, and nine months after the higher date. No, I agree. Three, six, and nine months after the higher date. Okay, okay, that's good. I, I just want her to know so she'll she'll know when we're going to have these reviews. So it's not like okay, tomorrow we're giving you a quarterly review. We need to have dates. That's what I'm saying. So. Okay, I agree. So that's all. So Ms. Barella, will you take the roll on uh, the motion? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Member Ortel? Yes. Thank you, that motion passed unanimously. And uh, Director Ewan, when we go over the evaluation, we will also, and I'll put it in writing, the dates using your date of hire for the quarterly reviews. Thank you, ma'am. Sure. Um, the next one is 9H. And the only update that I had to request is at our last board meeting, I believe we asked for an updated contact list that removes the board members uh, home address and we have not received that. So, Director Yoon, would you please make sure and we discuss that? Um, yes, I can get that to you. Okay. We'd like to uh, be sure that that was done. And I believe that's the, the only update that I will have. The, only, the, the other update that I will have, I will not ask for an update this month, but next month I'd like for an update. I don't wanna drop the ball. We still haven't got the investigation on those cases. As the board remember, I brought up about the riots. Remember the riots that were done? We brought it up. They said the cases were still, the, the investigator had uh, resigned during the time and the investigations still aren't done. Um, I will go back and get those case numbers, but I would like an update on those two cases at our next meeting. And so with that, we'll go on to item number, let's see, 10, we had moved them around, correct? So item number 10, I believe. And that's um, review of cases. Um, we have three sustained cases. 058-22, uh, 071-22, and 087-22. Um, let's start with the first one. 058-22, um, I'll make a motion that we agree to accept the CPOA's recommended discipline on 058-22. Is there a second? I move that we accept all of them. 
I've looked at them. I don't have a problem with anything. Okay, so um, I will amend my motion that we accept this, the agency's recommended discipline on 058-22, 071-22, 087-22. And was that a second from you, Member Nixon? Yes, it was. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. The only other issue I'd like to bring up, um, Director Ewing, 087-22 does not have your name on the findings letter. Okay, thank you for bringing that up. Okay. With that, um, any more discussion? Ms. Barilla, will you take the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Jackson? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Rayner? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you, that motion passed unanimously. Okay, on the next one, um, item 11, uh, non-concurrence cases, um, do we, is, I'm sorry, I'm having a brain delay here. Do we have to make a motion to accept these non-concurrence? There's really nothing we can do anyway. Chair French, no, I think this is a notation for the monitor to see what non-concurrence cases are out there and that the board has received responses. No. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So we do have to make a motion to accept? So moved. Okay. Chair um, French, no, you, you, you may, you, you're absolutely able to, but you don't need to. You just need to make a notation of the non-concurrence cases on the agenda for the public and the monitor so they're aware of them. Okay, well then we'll, we won't have a motion if we don't have to. I would just like to ask our executive uh, director, does she have any comments about APD not agreeing with seven cases uh, seven findings of the agency. Is there anything that stood out to you on any of these cases on that they absolutely, you don't understand why they didn't concur? Okay. Seven cases in one month, it's quite a few. I can't say um, that anything stood out. This being my first meeting, I really couldn't have said whether this was typical or atypical. I can certainly go back and look, but I'm not aware of um, anything unusual. It's my understanding is that all the, if I, it's my recollection that the non-concurrences were them disagreeing on discipline rather than on findings. And. True. Okay, that's fine. We, I, we don't need a, and it doesn't matter. I was just wondering if anything stood out to you as, you know, them not concurring on the discipline. And if not, that's fine. Not can move. Thank you. In, in support okay. of Director Ewing, um, as I looked at those cases, they, they went both ways. Uh, in some cases, APD wanted harsher in, uh, discipline. In some cases, they wanted less discipline. It was very hard to see a pattern of any kind. Um, okay. And I'd like to make one more comment. I think having read an awful lot of investigative reports now, um, I wish that the investigators would be more careful in their written communication. Lots of typos, lots of bad English. I think there's a difference between statue and statute, although I'm not sure that I can tell it from some of the investigative reports. Um, I think there needs to be more care taken in doing those. Just my opinion. And review. Whoever's reviewing should actually be catching those things. Yeah. And you're right. And you, you're talking about the investigative reports, Mike? Mike? Uh, it, it, it can be the police reports, it can be the investigative reports. Uh, the police reports are worse. I just don't expect as much out of the police officers. Um, I, I don't think they're reviewed as carefully. Understood. Does that make sense? It does. It does. 
Yeah, sometimes you have to go back and read it twice to really say, now, what did he say? Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. Okay. All well, right. The thing is, I'm, I'm always surprised when there are just words left out of sentences. Even, you know, the grammar check ought to catch that. I agree. It, it would be nice if it doesn't have to be in depth, but um, just some minor statistics, you know, maybe just a running spreadsheet on on these non concurs, just so that we can get an understanding if it's always discipline or if it's kind of like what you were saying, Mike, there maybe there's no pattern at all. And that's probably the that's the best outcome we can hope for is that these non concurs are purely based off of, you know, individual things and we don't start seeing patterns but unless we're tracking things like you know um are they asking for more or less or if it's discipline versus the actual findings just an understanding of how that's going over time would be nice just to look at because if you're if all we're doing is is accepting them into the record it doesn't it doesn't help um it it, it can give off that there's that APD is is going one way or the other. So it'd just be nice to track that a little bit. And it doesn't change the system. Right. If we don't look more carefully at the trends. And I agree, because I even saw I, one or two where APD cited case law. This is why we don't concur. You know, so those are things, yes, that would be great. Okay. I'm sorry, then we'll move on to um, agenda number 12, reports from the subcommittee, uh, policy and procedure, Member Crawford. Yeah, the policies and procedure subcommittee met uh, last week and the result was that uh, document you all saw. I don't think there's anything else uh, of note from policies and procedures. Okay, thank you. And personnel B, uh, that would be me. We met on the 29th. We talked about uh, the evaluation. We went through it. We gave uh, Director Ewing an opportunity to, for any feedback plus the committee. Uh, the other issue that we discussed is the timeline for reporting to City Council. I will ask uh, Mr. Stoker to make sure, and we have Mr. Sylvan here to make sure City Council realizes the timeline for them to Receive the evaluation will be one year from the date of hire. So we will make sure that that gets back to city council and the reason being why we're doing that. And so let's move on uh, to reports um, from city departments. And I just wanna um, extend my apology to everyone who's been waiting. Uh, as you know, my, in the past, uh, the meetings I run usually don't last this long, but due to us having appeal, it was very important that we take the time necessary for this to review all the facts for this citizen. So um, hopefully this won't happen again, but uh, we do wanna take care of board business first, and then we'll move on to uh, reports from a city department. So we'll start with um, 13A, APD, IA Professional Standards Division, uh, Acting Commander uh, Landavasso. Good evening, Chair French and members of the board. Um, so you all have been provided a copy of our uh, of our monthly breakdown for August 2022. Um, within IEPS, we closed 26 cases for the month. Um, and we opened, the number of cases we opened was the number of 17. And uh, IA cases opened within the area commands was 29 for the month. Uh, we currently have 46 pending cases and we had zero internal cases me uh, mediated. And I stand for any questions. Um, I have a question, uh, Commander Landabasso. Uh, when you said you don't have so many mediated, um, mm -hmm. do you usually have those cases mediated? There hasn't been one since I've been here. It's not, it's not a common occurrence, no, Madam Chair. That's what I was thinking. I don't ever remember an IA saying, well, we're going to send it over to mediation. <laughs> okay. All right. I was just wondering about that. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you waiting. Thank you. Have a good night. Good evening. And we'll move on to two IA Force Division. Commander Scott Norris, is he with us? Uh, good evening. No, he's not. Actually, uh, he took a well-deserved break, so I'm here. Uh, okay. I'm Deputy Commander Anthony Mace. Yes. 
Um, let me pull up PowerPoint really quick. And uh, this will uh, just take me one moment here. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay. Let me put it in a slideshow format. Hopefully that'll work. Just so uh, I know um, the uh, we have a, a new Miss um, Inwig. We got a chance to meet, uh, I guess it was last week at an FRB. And I know you're new to the new to the first meeting. So I thought I'd just share with you the force of category levels. Uh, just so everyone's again, just familiar with the category levels. Again, level one force is likely to cause only transitory pain, disorientation, discomfort during an application. Level two or force that causes injury um, could reasonably be expected to cause injury or results in complaint of injury. And level three force results in or could reasonably result in serious physical injury, hospitalization, or death. Now, of course, these are broken down further, and I believe um, that's included in the handouts that you received as well. Um, we had a free, uh, actually, that uh, number is not correct. The uh, 39, let me see, I think that is, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't actually have the calls for service. I thought that number was actually reflected on this. But it, as we break it down here, as you can see the level ones, um, level ones um, are, were, we had eight total for the entire city. Uh, level twos, we had 38. Um, we saw an increase, of course, uh, uh, this time in the southeast, um, it's it seems like it's going back and forth. Um, and then level threes, um, we had a total of five. So you can see here, this is a breakdown of the different levels. And again, um, the southeast showing the highest number of level twos, um, followed by uh, the northeast, and then uh, of course uh, the way the southwest and then the valley and the foothills and uh, northwest were tied with that with level twos. We see a breakdown here for uh, on, on the different types of calls in which, and as you can see the family disputes and disturbances with the highest number uh, of force were seven of each one of those. And then it goes down from there with uh, suspicious vehicles and persons, um, fives and fours, a wanted persons, and as it goes further down. Um, some of the things I want I wanted to note here is uh, if you look at this, uh, the 12 month force data breakdown, um, what we saw is uh, in September of 2021, um, a considerable increase. So it's something again, we'll revisit um, next month um, if, if that's gonna hold true for uh, September, 2022. But as you can see here, the, the numbers have kind of fluctuated um, where uh, we saw an increase in March um, in most of the area commands. Um, and again, um, in, in comparison, the highest numbers that seem to be in September, if you compare 2021, and again, we'll look at 2022 next month. Um, the 12 month force data here, again, showing the, the breakdown where well, you can see again in September, 2021, we're showing 65 um, actually force cases. And uh, just so everyone understands the, this includes out of area. What that would mean is um, if uh, our, um, let's say for example, we assist uh, Rio Rancho police with um, a SWAT situation or um, uh, any, anywhere else in state, I mean, which is, um, you're all familiar that um, other agencies help assist the APD and we assist other agencies. So that this number would include, the, that's what it includes out of area means. Approximately how many do you think are out of area? Um, I try to get that number um, actually this week and uh, there wasn't a clear number of that, but I can certainly ask again, and see if we can figure out. I, I'm sure it, it, it isn't a lot though, because if we go back and look at the very first slide, um, they're broken down by the area commands and the numbers are very close to what we see here. Uh, you don't have to, it was just out of curiosity. Since you included out of the area, I just wanted to know. If it, it, oh, I, 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 you're right. You know, and I actually, when I actually got these stats from our, uh, uh, 
I was asking that exact question. I go, what's out of the area? I've never seen that before. And then she, she explained to me, it's when we assist other agencies. So, but um, again, I can certainly break that down for you. I have no problem and send it over to you if you'd like. No, that's that's fine, Commander. Okay, great. And that is it. I'm, I'm open for any questions you may have. Um, uh, Commander, the only question I really had was, when it comes to collaboration with um, government agencies such as ATF or, or DEA, um, do we ever get statistics on that or are those rolled up to the federal side? I'm, I'm kind of curious as to um, the, the effectiveness of those kind of collaborations with um, law enforcement uh, in, in, in New Mexico and if there's any status data that you guys have, can get your hands on for that. I'm sure we can. Um... Uh, uh, board member Nixon, Nixon, that shouldn't be a problem at all. We can certainly get that. I know on the federal side, they do keep track of that because uh, previous, uh, my previous employer that I, I worked with the attorney general and we work very close with the federal agencies. And um, I know they were keeping a lot of the data when we, we would work with each other as task force officers. Um, so I, I imagine we probably keep that as well here. Okay. Thank you. Are there any more questions, Dr. Thunder? If not, um, thank you very much. I appreciate you staying. I have a quick question. Um, sure, sorry. Is this, is this presentation provided to us or can it be provided? I, I don't yeah. I don't remember seeing it in my inbox. Yeah, there's a, there's a PDF uh, that was provided. Okay, I must have missed it. That's all okay. I have. And it's always included in the packet. If you look in the packet, go back and look at the agenda packet. Is that what you said, Member Nixon? I didn't understand. Yeah, Rashad, what that thing that we, we download, sometimes it has a, a lot of different files in it. It's in there. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm still sorting through all that stuff. So thank you. Now I know where to go. Thanks. One other quick question. I, and I had mentioned this either at the last meeting or two meetings ago. Can we get data on the populations of each of the area commands? Yes, that, that won't be a problem at all. I think that would just put some of this into perspective too. And it, and it might take it out of perspective as well. No problem, I can get that for you. Thank you. Thank you. You know what I was looking at also is, and I know they give us the calls, they give us the, um, the calls for service for those particular type of cases. But Southeast is always higher than the rest of them, but a lot of it has to do with the number of calls that Southeast gets. And we never get that comparison. Total calls. I don't mean just when you're talking about serious use of force or those type of the, uh, cases. I think that it would be beneficial to say, okay, this is how many Northwest got compared to how many Southeast got in the same time period on calls for service. Actually, I'm, um, so I'm looking at the numbers now and it looks like there's a breakdown on the handout that you received. Um, it shows 39,054 um, uh, 39, calls. It looks like there's a total for the Southeast, 9,399 calls for the Southeast. I think it was on the first page, wasn't it? I believe so, yes. I'm trying to find it on my handout. But um, here it is. So I think it's on the first page and that breaks down each area of command. Um, and, yeah, and there it is. So it breaks down each area of command. So that's a really good question. So yes, yeah, so it has the, the calls. So for example, the Southeast had 9,399 calls and they had five level ones. 12 level twos and one level three. So what I would like to see, and I, I understand that is total calls for the month, give us the total in the area, but the percentage of total calls that that area command took for the entire department for the month. Okay. Do you see the percentage? That shows us better than Southeast got 9,000, Northwest got 2,000. What percentage of calls did they okay. take? Yeah, we can, we can certainly get that. I mean, that's no problem. If so I had the time, I could do the math, but I don't have the time. <laughs> All right. 
it's too late for my brain at this time. Yeah, I understand. And again, I apologize. It won't be this long next time, unless we have an appeal again. Um, oh, no, I, no worries. Our <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. Appreciate you staying. Yes. Okay, next we have um, 13B, uh, City Council, Mr. Sylvan. Good evening, Chair French, Honorable Board, Chris Sylvan, Albuquerque City Council. Uh, update that I have for you tonight is we have two potential members to the board that are going to be meeting with the city councilors sometime over the next two weeks. Um, I know this process has been a very, very long, drawn out process, but um, I think that our vetting has gotten better because when we talk to people and the newest members of the board can attest to this, in our pre-interview before they go to the counselors, we explain to folks how much time you have to put on to this board. And we really drill down and let folks know that this is gonna take a lot of your time. It's a volunteer board, but there's a lot of time involved with this board. And that, um, to put it lightly, is probably scared a few people off. I know one or two said that they didn't have the time commitment, they were interested, but once we let them know what the hours were, it you know didn't happen. So on that note, I want to end on a positive note and say, yes, we do have two that will be meeting with the city councilors next week. And with that, I stand for questions. Uh, Chris, I'm about the evaluation of the executive director and the ordinance states that we will do it on a calendar year. I don't know how to get the information to a city council. Do we send it? through your department, do we send it straight to um, the chair, the president, uh, that it will be based on hire date, not based on calendar year? How do we make that official? Chair French board, um, what I believe would happen, and I'm reaching for this and I'll get a better answer for you, is you would just draft a memo and what we would do is introduce, introduce the legislation as a OC, other communication, that means that you are talking to the council and changing your rules. Okay. All right. We will get that done. Thank you. One other question, Chris. Uh, when you're talking about the time commitment of the board, uh, yes, the board work itself is a time commitment. Uh, are you mentioning the initial training that's, that's required? Uh, specifically the Citizen Police Academy. Chair French, Board Member Wartell, yes. We are discussing that. That's kind of one of the things that we're preloading folks with. Like, do you have time to go to NACOL? Do you have time to go to the Citizens Police Academy? I mean, a lot of these things are onerous. I won't deny that. But, you know, we are letting folks know that there's a lot of outside of normal work hours work involved. Oh, Nick yeah. is once a year, so that's not terrible. But Citizens Police Academy is 12 weeks, twice a week. Uh, that's, that's very hard on some folks, especially when they're working. Yeah, but you know what, Mike, more to your, your point, just being honest and having gone through the Citizens Police Academy, now I didn't do the 12 week, I did the short week. By the same token, I don't, I don't know that it's necessary. Um, when, when I think about serving with the CPCs versus being on the CPOA board, I can honestly tell you that there was no, even, even the knowledge, I'm not saying that the, the officers and the trainers weren't good, they were excellent. But as far as being a board member, I honestly didn't see a value added. I, I did not, I'm sorry, but, you know, we've got plenty of information at our, our fingertips to look over, you know, SOPs and uh, ordinances and so on and so forth, but I, I didn't see a value added. Please, Chris, yeah. take that to the bank for us. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a precursor for being a board member at all. Um, in fact, I think it could, kind of sway the other way, in my opinion. 
I think it's it's better to have a board member that's more representative of the community versus a board member that's being assimilated or indoctrinated somehow into a policing law enforcement uh, mentality slash environment. So. Okay, Chris. Marching orders, right? Okay, we'll move on to Public Safety Committee. Thanks, Chair French, um, board. Um, Public Safety Committee meeting, um, we still have not met. The meeting that was supposed to take place this Tuesday has been canceled, so I, I'm saving myself sending everybody an email about that. And those meetings have gone back to in person. They are in the committee room on the ninth floor, New City Hall. The item that would have been of interest to um, this board is it would have been OC 22-12, which is the 2021 second half of the semi-annual report for the agency. And I believe that that will be, since the committee is not gonna happen, that that um, OC will be heard at the next council meeting in two weeks. And that's my public safety committee meeting. I mean, my public safety committee report. Okay. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> Are there any questions? If not, we'll move to city attorney, uh, Ms. Keith. Is she's here? I haven't seen her. Uh, Carlos, are you here? Honorable there Chair, you. I believe uh, Pastor Walker is next on the agenda for the mayor's office. Oh, I'm sorry. I marked him out. You're absolutely right. Pastor Walker, <laughs> how are you? Fine. How are you all tonight? Sorry to keep you waiting. <laughs> you marked me out. I've been sitting here waiting and listening all night long, and you marked me out. I, I do have something to report tonight. Uh, if you haven't heard already, that subject to uh, council approval, uh, former Metro Court Judge Victor Valdez uh, has been named the new superintendent of police reform, replacing uh, the interim Deputy Chief Eric uh, Garcia who we know replaced Sylvester Stanley. And so we are waiting on approval from the council and uh, a former uh, Metro Court Judge Victor Valdez has been uh, named the superintendent of police reform. That's my report for tonight. Thank you, um, Pastor Walker. Um, are there any questions from the board? If not, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you all. You guys have a good evening. Thank you. E, um, City Attorney, Carlos. Uh, good evening, uh, board. Um, as uh, Pastor Walker indicated, uh, the mayor did uh, appoint a uh, uh, retired Metro Court Judge uh, Victor Valdez to the, uh, to the position of uh, Superintendent of Reform. I think uh, they envision the position to be uh, uh, something as uh, along the lines of mimicking the function of the monitor, that is uh, reviewing discipline, um, uh, evaluating the and making recommendations uh, as far as that what that discipline is. Um, Eric, uh, Eric Garcia will remain in that uh, office. Um, is a step below uh, actually implementing, uh, doing what he is currently doing in a lot of functions, but uh, he'll have the oversight of Victor Valdez. Um, and he's gonna be looking out for the over, overall fairness and, and providing some civilian oversight of uh, APD. And so uh, we're, we're excited to uh, be bringing uh, uh, Judge Valdez on to uh, overseeing APD. I think he's gonna bring a lot of valuable experience from his Metro court uh, time um, and, and his former time with the city as well. And so I think that'll be uh, very useful. Uh, and so uh, that, that is uh, of note. Uh, some discussion was made about the uh, EFIT hearing that's coming up. I believe it's uh, scheduled for October. Sorry, I'm checking my notes. I believe it's the afternoon of October 5th. Um, I don't think this was made note of, but uh, it will be a hybrid hearing, meaning 
You can appear by Zoom if you choose to appear by Zoom, but you can also appear by person if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that will be a slight change from uh, previous hearings. Um, we did have uh, some productive uh, some productive discussion with Member Nixon, and I appreciate uh, the discussion that we did have. And I think there's some clarifications that need to happen. It's always a process, and there's always work to be done. But uh, I do I do appreciate the dialogue, and so hopefully we'll we'll get there. Uh, same thing with the training. I think we're we're making good progress as far as getting uh, the the trainings implemented. And so I'm very optimistic in that light as well. Uh, with that said, uh, it's been a long night, so uh, I'll uh, stand for questions. Oh, one other item. Um, I did want to welcome Ms. Ewing aboard. Um, I, I had it top of my list and I just went straight out of the shoot to business, but I did want to welcome her. I did, uh, I have seen her presence at the uh, FRB meetings and I think she's still um, learning the process and getting a feel for things, but I think she's uh, off to a very good start and a very good sprint along things. So I look forward to working with her as well. So welcome aboard. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Pacheco? Pacheco? If not, it's been a long night. Thank you very much, Carlos. We'll look forward to hearing from you at our next meeting. Thank you. And we'll move on to CPC, Kelly Mensa. Good evening, Chair Finch. Good evening, Honorable Ward. I hope everyone's doing well tonight. Uh, we've had a few pretty good activities this month. We've been kind of busy uh, getting the word out and just uh, looking for new members. We did a lunchtime event at Domingo Baca where we put up a table and talked to some people there and uh, got one applicant and a couple of other people that said they were gonna tune in. We did a Northwest Town Hall, which was put on by the state. That was at a Ladera Golf Course. It was an excellent event with a few hundred attendees. And uh, we had the table there. We signed up eight people and uh, we, we passed out a lot of information, a lot of brochures. Hopefully we're looking to get some bounce off of that one. Uh, we have been planning for, uh, we're, we're going to be subsidizing CPC members on the upcoming NACOM event, which is going to be online. Uh, they've got a session on police oversight, which we think uh, directly relates to uh, the CPC, and that's going to be a good event for us. And we've opened that up for uh, 12 spots. Uh, we are also attending the NACO dinner next month, as a, a lot of you are aware the NACO training, I should say, next week. And um, we are planning it for our yearly year-end meeting slash dinner, which is going to be December 6th, which coincides with the monitor's visit. That was a good event last year. It was mostly subsidized by the city council. So we're working on getting subsidies again. Next week, I will be out of town at the NACO event. And we do have three meetings. Two are going to be hybrid. One is going back to Zoom. So we've been planning hybrid meetings without our assistance there. Generally, we use a specialized camera called the OWL camera. I won't be here, so we can't use that camera. We've been planning on ways to get a bunch of laptops there, get some external microphones, and hopefully do a good job with our Foothills and Southeast events next week. We'll see how that works out. Um, the Council of Chairs Town Hall which was suggested by uh, monitor Steve Rickman. Uh, we are going to open up our last Council of Chairs meeting, which is always the fourth uh, Saturday of the month. And uh, it's going to be, this one is going to be in October and we're going to open it up to the public. So anyone who has attended a uh, CPC meeting this year, we're going to send the invite to attend our Council of Chairs meetings to tell the chairs what we can do better next year to tell them what is substandard and what they like and what they don't like. And uh, we think that's gonna be a good opportunity for the CPC. We also have received uh, four applications this month. Three councils are doing interviews on backlogged applications. And we do have one new member thus far with a couple new expected in uh, September. So that is our report for the month of um, August coming into September. I will stand for questions. 
Um, Kelly, I noticed that there was a series of cancellation on meetings, and I, I just kind of saw those on my email. Was that, were you guys rescheduling something or adjusting something to a different day or maybe? Well, uh, we, I scheduled the meetings 12 months, and then we figure out who's going to do holiday area meetings later okay. on in the year. So we had a couple of meetings, for instance, the uh, Valley meeting was going to be December 26th. So we mm -hmm. canceled that one. We got another Valley meeting that's the day before Thanksgiving, I believe. So the last meeting in the Valley will be in mm -hmm. October. And uh, we are going to have three meetings in December anyway. A couple of them were a little too close to the uh, Christmas holiday. So right. there was no point. Really, they just canceled them. Okay, thank you. Kelly, I have a question for you. You said that you had some kind of meeting. You signed up eight members. You got four applicants going through. How many vacancies does CPC have? Well, we are uh, able to have 11, um, what do you call them? Uh, 11, 11 council members in each area of command. So that's a total of 66. We've never hit 66 before. We've got 45 or 46 right now. So we've got an average of uh, like uh, eight, eight members per council. Some of them are high. We do have 11 and two councils. We have three and one. She hasn't been doing a whole lot of recruiting, but we're, we're, we're looking to work on that. Um, the main recruiting tool has been the actual meeting. So when we have good meetings and when they put the minutes out early and when they put the agendas out early and that sort of stuff is when we get a lot of people. But there are some councils that do a better job in that than others. But I wasn't talking about attendees. I was talking about board members. Yeah. So you're eligible to have 11 in each area? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 10 with an option of one. And we got an average of about eight per council right now. How much on an average are leaving per month? Do you have an average of that? How many, say, in the last six months? How in many the last six months, I'd say we've had about eight leave. And we, I mean, it's a constant churn. We have, they leave and they come back. And, you know, our, our steady is probably 40 to 50 council members. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Were there any other questions? Okay. All right. Have a good evening, Kelly. Thank you. Have a and nice we'll, we'll move on to APOA. And I don't believe I saw anyone here. Nope. And so we'll move on to item H. Uh, Director Ewing. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, so since the August 11th uh, meeting, the CPOA has received 12 driving complaints. Those have primarily come in through 311. We've received and opened cases on 20 new complaints. We've also received five officer commendations. Um, in terms of staffing updates, obviously I got started August 22nd. I'm doing a lot of introductions with people around, um, around the various city departments. My trainings are ongoing, um, including uh, what I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this. The ordinance does require me to do a lot, do the same onboarding trainings that the members of the board do. So, um, I've heard a lot of you guys talk about the, uh, onboarding process for all of those trainings and soon I will feel your pain. Um, so <laughs> we're going to be focusing on getting those set up once we get back from NACOL. Um, I've spoken with our HR representative Beverly Samuels. Um, she submitted the requisitions to repost the community engagement specialist position that was posted and had applicants before I came. That's going to be reposted as will be the executive assistant position that's been um, approved. Also, uh, for those of you who haven't heard yet, our data analyst, Ali Abbasi, is leaving us. His last day with the, with the agency is going to be October 6th. He's transferring over to um, the analytics department at APD. So it's going to be a loss for the agency, but we're obviously very happy for him uh, to have an exciting new opportunity, though. Again, we'll obviously miss him. I've been in touch with Ms. Samuels about that and um, have been working with her on getting that position posted as quickly as possible as well. Um, Ms. Samuels has also sent an email to the uh, compensation and classification HR analyst um, to find out what exactly is going on with our policy analyst position that's been stuck 
at that level of review for quite a while. She has not heard back, but when I know more, I will make sure you all know more. But I'm staying on top of that issue because obviously we need the policy analyst and the sooner we can get that posted, the sooner we can start interviewing people. Um, in addition to what Kelly just talked about with the CPCs, I attended my first uh, Council of Chairs meeting a few weeks back. And um, one of the topics of discussion was not just the issue of recruitment, but the issue of diversity in the recruitment pool. And it occurred to me that I knew of a recruitment pool that could help pull in some more diverse applicants. Um, so the next week I got in touch with the two public defenders I know who are associated with the young adult court here in the second judicial district. Uh, that is um, a treatment court for people ages 18 to 25, getting them in touch with um, social services, career services, basically helping them um, really helping them get back on a better path before they become any sort of a habitual offender or recidivist and really help them get on the path of being a solid citizen. It occurred to me that um, racial minorities have a tendency to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system and we could um, add that level of diversity also. As a young adult court, it does pull in age diversity, but also we'd be uh, received, we, it could pro prove to have some viewpoint and life experience diversity for the CPCs, bringing in people who have had some actual life experience with the criminal justice system and giving people with that life experience a chance to have some sort of a voice when it comes to community policing efforts. Um, I haven't heard back. I know that um, the last um, young adult court staffing meeting last Friday, the agenda was pretty booked and they weren't able to add it to their agenda. Young adult courts not meeting this week. They may, I believe they're meeting next week. Um, I've also made the offer to come over and um, let them know that they can also obviously reach out to Kelly. So we'll let you know if we hear anything from that as well. Um, we received notice recently that APOA is filing a petition to create a new union so that they can represent the um, IA civilian investigators. There's about 15 of those. Um, comments were, in, were invited with a deadline of yesterday. I declined to comment. I didn't feel it was appropriate an appropriate issue for CPOA to weigh in on. Um, I do believe there were other parties who chose to comment. I just did not think it was really an issue that was in our wheelhouse to weigh in on. Um, as Chair French mentioned earlier, um, and uh, Councillor Gooch mentioned, the EFIT uh, quarterly reports came out. The hearing is tentatively scheduled for October 5th. I, again, concur with Chair French. I don't believe that there is anything in those EFIT reports for either the board or certainly for the agency to comment on, um, but I did want to bring that pending, um, that pending hearing to the board's attention in case the board disagreed with me on whether they wanted to comment and if they wanted, if the board wanted to appear, because obviously we would need to know so that we could post um, if enough board members wanted to attend that hearing that we had to post a notice of possible quorum. Um, just so you all know, we've got notice um, since I started that the independent monitoring team will be coming for its next visit the week of December 5th through the 9th. Uh, Kelly mentioned that in his report as well, um, as that's going to be when we are going to be doing the CPC annual dinner. Um, as Kelly mentioned previously, most of the CPOA office will be in uh, Fort Worth next week for the NACOL conference, along with a few members of the board who I'm looking very much forward to getting to know better. Um, as Chair French mentioned earlier in the meeting, the travel requisition process for, um, for travel is incredibly onerous. Um, except for the time she spent getting me on board. That's pretty much been all that Katrina has been doing full time for the last two weeks. 
Um, she is going to be getting the registrations for the virtual NACOL done tomorrow. I asked her to wait until tomorrow when she was done with everything for the travel today because I wanted to be sure we gave the members of the board one more chance to let us know if there's anyone besides members Wartell and Nixon who wanted to attend the virtual conference so that we could make sure that those registrations happened at the same time. Um, with that, I do believe that's everything, aside from just expressing my personal excitement at the um, nomination of Judge Valdez for the superintendent of reform. Um, I didn't get to work with him much when I worked in Metro, but always had a great deal of respect for him and look forward to the possibility of getting to work with him again. Um, but from that, I stand for questions. Thank you. I have. So, so Deidre, I have a question, and this kind of pertains to uh, yourself and Kelly as well. When it comes to recruiting, both for CPC and CPOA, and I say recruiting loosely because you, what we want to do is attract um, individuals that want to do it, but also a, a good diversity of folks that want to do this kind of work. My concern, especially with this country, is that with the absence of civics in like, say, high schools and things like that, that there's, there's a generation gap when it comes to this kind of work. Um, and what people are doing to volunteer. And so what I'm wondering is when you when it comes to CPCs, when it comes to ju uh, juvenile courts, and not juvenile courts, I forgot uh, 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 the courts that you were talking about. Was it juvenile? Young Was adult it? court. Yeah, young adult court. Um, I'm thinking to myself too, when it comes to restorative justice, there is a restorative justice piece in here in public safety. Uh, uh, I actually do, dealing with um, uh, violence in, uh, intervention uh, programs and stuff like that. So I'm wondering if those folks being able to, to be targeted as far as these recruiting efforts come in. The other piece to that is um, in high schools and even in middle schools, uh, being able to reach out to those folks about CPCs and about CPOAs and what they do so that they're getting an understanding that isn't so divisive when it comes to one protest or another, but they're actually seeing that, hey, actually, these entities work for you in your, in your community, and you should be a part of these kind of um, efforts uh, to, you know, civilian police oversight, uh, community policing, and, and the benefits of, of being part of those, and, and not necessarily um, increasing or exacerbating the, the, the generation gap that I see happening now. Because when I was coming on board, I noticed that people were pretty uh, elderly and I, in, in, these, in these different positions, whereas working folks like myself um, were there, but kind of not there because you know, you're trying to juggle these things. But also these young adults coming out of high school, coming out of college are definitely prime for being in positions like this, because we have to have a cross section of diversity within these, you know, these kind of efforts. And I'm wondering if, if you know, you guys have any bandwidth to do that, to maybe go into schools and go into different places to to speak to them and and, and bring up some recruiting efforts. And I I apologize if that's kind of antiquated the, the ask, but I you know I just wanted to ask out of curiosity on that. That's not at all. Um... Member Nixon, Chair French, members of the board. I do think that's something I would like us to be able to do. I think we'll have more bandwidth to do that when we get a community engagement specialist on board, because I do think that that is an important part of it. But I do know um, that, for instance, the New Mexico Bar once a year does um, Constitution Day, usually in I feel like it's in September, but I could be wrong. Um, and recruits lawyers to go actually to elementary schools and teach mm -hmm. the kids. And I've I've done that a lot um, mm -hmm. in the past when I, as a public defender, I went to various fifth grade classes and taught them about the Bill of Rights and mm -hmm. made them watch some Schoolhouse Rock because that never goes out of style. I don't care who nope. you are. Nope. Um, <laughs> So it is absolutely something I'm open to. It is something that I would certainly want um, to include the community engagement specialist in, um, not just going into the schools, but also um, opening up a social media presence that's more effective, because that's certainly a, a, a 
an important tool, I think, to reaching younger generations. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Director Ewing, I have um, another question. I guess it doesn't have to do um, with, your, with your report. Just a couple of questions back to the NACO conference. Yes, ma'am. I had asked um, Member Crawford and Member Rayner, in case you guys didn't know, because the airport is a long ways from the conference or whatever, the agency has decided to get a rental car, but I am the only driver. I don't know if you're gonna feel safe driving with me in Fort Worth, but anyway, <laughs> I have asked um, that one of you also take the driving class. It's, I don't know how long, you have to watch the videos and then they automatically send you your certificate. And I didn't hear back from her. And then also member Crawford, I wanted to let you know, um, I understood about the airline and um, that was me because the conference, I, I had set us out to leave out on a, I said I wanted to leave out on a on a sat on a Sunday, but when I looked at the agenda, the conference starts at noon that Sunday. So then I said I wanted to leave Saturday, so I'd be there. I did book us back. I, I did say I was coming back on Thursday, and I'm just telling you, I didn't book your airfare. I only booked your hotel. I mean, I only made a reservation. And the reason why I did that is because the conference ends before noon, and so you know I didn't see there was justification for spending another night. If you could get a flight out at three o'clock and the conference ends at, at before noon. So that's the reason that I made the reservations for the date that I did. So I just wanted to be clear. But um, Ms. Ewing, on the um, driver, did you ever find out about that? Or am I going to be the only one? So I, the I'm, young man? I'm so sorry. I had the follow-up conversation with Katrina and forgot to call you. So my apologies for that. Um, Katrina was going to be emailing uh, both members, um, I'm trying to remember who's coming, members Rayner and mem members Crawford uh, to let the, to send them the same link she sent you to do the training. Um, both of you should have that email. If you don't, um, please let me know so I can follow up with Katrina in the morning. Um, and as, as Chair French said, I actually just went through the same training myself because I'm driving. Um, it's about 45 minutes of watching videos um, and the quiz at the end is simply verifying that you have watched the videos and um, that you will abide by the rules presented in the videos. It's not a knowledge quiz or anything. So it's, and they even give you two or three tries to get the true I have done this part um, right. So it's a very user-friendly process. Um, but you should have those links in your emails. If you can connect to those, it'll be a, like I said, 45, 47 minute process to get that certificate. Um, Thank you, Member Rayner. I will follow up with Katrina first thing in the morning so that we can make sure you get those emails so that it is not just uh, Chair French driving. I did get that email, so. Okay. Huh? It, it went out somewhere, uh, but uh, uh, Member Rayner might not be on that list yet or something. Thank you. Oh, okay, all right. I'm just saying, you know, you never wanna drive without a spare. And if I'm the only one driving, you're riding without a spare, so. With that, we'll move on. Is there um, any more um, old business? If not, then we'll go on to new business. Um, I just wanna say that I wanna welcome our new executive director, Ewing. Um, I appreciate uh, all that you've done so far. I look forward to meeting you meeting with the board one-on-one -on -one and with us having our weekly meetings or uh, whenever we deem it necessary. So I just want to welcome you on board and say um, we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Are there any other comments? Just a comment, Chair French. Um, since we can't really predict how long the appeals process will be in any given meeting, perhaps it would be good to have a discussion about sending appeals off to a special meeting. Um, you know, the deliberations uh, in executive session could extend over a period of time. And, and 
that's very hard on the people who are waiting for first hand. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like that. Yeah. I think it's worth the discussion. I agree, and we can discuss it. I, I think we have three board members currently that work 40 hours a week. And so to keep, you know, not just the people that are waiting to present, but to keep them on a meeting this this long, like I said, this is historically how long our meetings used to last, and I just don't want to continue with this pattern. So I that's why I moved this uh, serious use of force cases to a special meeting. So uh, I look forward to, to doing that. Um, Councilor Gooch. Thank you, um, Chair French, Member Wartell. I will note that the ordinance has specific provisions that the board is bound by regarding the request for reconsideration that's, that state certain timelines and that it will be heard at your next regularly scheduled meeting. Um, so I just note that in the ordinance for everyone's okay. awareness as part of those discussions. Okay. Well, we what have we have no choice. Is that what you're saying, Councilor? Chair French, uh, Member Wartell, yeah, I'm saying 9-4-1-9A dictates your procedure for appeals, and it says that you shall have it at your next regularly scheduled meeting, so long as there's 10 days prior to the notice going out, and some other deadlines that go along with that. Yeah, but I, 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 I think apologize just, for bringing it up. Well, I'm, I'm thinking there's ways around that, in that if we're gonna have a special meeting or, or an out of, out of sync meeting that we can discuss, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that that is the initial or official um, reconsideration meeting per se. So I, I like the idea of being able to get a lot of the grunt work down. For example, Tina, one of the advantages would be that we can get all of the information for the reconsideration because for example, we had the uh, appeal, but we didn't have the original findings information. So we would be able to discuss that more in depth if we don't have a time crunch, if we're gonna set aside that hour or two to actually talk about that, then we're, we're better prepared when it comes to the actual official reconsideration meeting that you're talking about within the ordinance. So as this would be an adjunct to that, but I think that it would cut down on the process a bit, um, Patty. We could talk about that. I think there are some ways around that that I'm thinking of. I agree. And I think the board should be notified as soon as the agency is notified that somebody wants to appeal. Yeah, agreed. Because agreed. I looked at the date he sent the appeal and the date we got it. And it was like 10 days later or maybe more. So we need to be notified of that. But I, I agree there are workarounds, such as if we're going to have an appeal, if it has to be the regular meeting, then um, I think most of you are, I don't know when um, member Rayner is available or Nixon, but we could say, okay, we're gonna start at 3.30 or four. That's the first thing on the agenda. There are workarounds, you know, and our regular meeting starts at five or 5.30, you know, for everything else. There's, there's workarounds for that. So I agree. But, we can talk. Moreover, I, I like to also make sure that we have the original case files from, from, the, from the original case there oh. as well as what the appeal is because i didn't i didn't see the findings i don't believe i, saw, I didn't did i see obdr no i didn't i don't think i saw the obrd either well no i did yeah there was a bar the OBRD, there were there's OBRDs. No yeah, yeah there's no reason not to have findings information and you know th that kind of stuff i just believe if it's possible when the agency gets notified the case is closed they sent the finding letters to the gentleman that we get all that information within a couple of days of the agency getting it. And that way we don't have to wait and get that information the same time we get all the rest of our cases and have to go through all. It was very, very time consuming this month. Agreed. Well, that's just one extra job for Councillor Gooch. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And with that, is there um, anything else? I just want to echo the welcome to Ms. Ewing, and I also want to extend a uh, thank you to Ollie. He's been a, a big help, especially at the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee, and we'll definitely miss him. Oh, absolutely. I forgot to mention that, too. Ollie has been nothing but helpful. Anytime I'm asking for any statistics to follow up with APD, he has been absolutely wonderful, and we will miss him. Absolutely, we will. Is there anything else? Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. 
right. I don't think we need to call the roll, but since we do that in the past, Ms. Perella. We didn't get a second. Second. Oh. Okay. We didn't do it. We didn't do it last time, did we? No, I don't we think didn't. we did. No, we didn't. Right. Everybody have a good evening, and I apologize, but we got out before ten. We got out <laughs> before nine thirty. Right. Before nine thirty, let's say that. Yeah. Sounds good. Right. Um, and I'll be seeing some Bye. of you in Fort Worth. Yeah. <laughs>